Good morning. My name is Jamila Best Johnson, and I serve as the designated federal officer for the Communications, Equity, and Diversity Council of the Federal Communications Commission. Welcome to today's roundtable discussion on lessons learned from the pandemic on broadband access, affordability, and deployment. We expect to have an engaging and informative discussion with experts from across the country, including from community organizations, federal agencies with emergency broadband funding, state agencies, and internet service providers. Shortly, you will hear from Ms. Heather Gate, Vice President of Digital Inclusion for Connected Nation, who serves as chair of the Communications Equity and Diversity Council. Following Ms. Gates' opening remarks, we will have panel one on affordability, availability, and deployment, which will focus on successful strategies that have been implemented to promote deployment of affordable and accessible broadband service during the pandemic. We will have a short break in the round table at 11.25 a.m. Thereafter, panel two on adoption and digital readiness will help identify programs initiated during the pandemic to address adoption and digital readiness, as well as the opportunities that exist to scale successful programs. We look forward to hearing from all of these impressive stakeholders. The Communications Equity and Diversity Council is a federal advisory committee rechartered in 2021 by FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. The Council's mission is to make recommendations to the Commission on advancing equity in the provision of and access to digital communication services and products for all people of the United States without discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, or disability. The Council has three working groups innovation and access, diversity and equity, and the planning working group for today's roundtable, digital empowerment and inclusion. We thank the members of this working group, including the chair, Dr. Dominique Harrison, for all of their efforts in developing this roundtable. Lastly, a bit of housekeeping. During the roundtable, members of the public may submit questions for the panelists. Please email your questions to livequestions at fcc.gov. That's one word, livequestions at fcc.gov. Thank you. It's my pleasure to now introduce for opening remarks, the chair of the Communications Equity and Diversity Council, Ms. Heather Gate, who is executive vice president for digital inclusion at Connected Nation. Good morning, Heather. Good morning, Jamila, and thank you very much to you uh, and our other designated federal offices, Diana Coho and Ashley Tyson, for helping us to put together this fantastic program and everything that you do to keep us on schedule and on track to and compliance with what we were supposed to be doing. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Chairwoman Rosen Walsall for her leadership, her passion for advancing digital equity, and for allowing us to use this FCC platform to conduct this important roundtable discussion. Welcome to the CEDC's roundtable on the lessons learned from programming and interventions that helped to advance broadband access, affordability, and deployment since the onset of the pandemic. Thank you again to the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group for putting together this excellent agenda. Thanks to our esteemed panelists for blessing us with your time and your experiences and your knowledge today. We are incredibly honored that you agreed to join us today for this moment of reflection on the lessons learned from broadband related responses to the pandemic. Why is this important? It's important because these lessons learned discussions allow us to transform our reflections on past successes and losses into actionable insights 
that help us to make more informed decisions in the future. And why does this matter to the CEDC? It matters because we are charged with making recommendations to the FCC on advancing equity in the provisions of and access to digital communication services for all people of the United States without discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, or disability. What a great way to gather critical information then to that will help to inform our recommendation then to facilitate <clears throat> then to facilitate this round table to listen and learn from those that played a key role in digital inclusion programming. So in helping to set the stage for today's round table, I am tasked with starting this discussion by talking about the injection of funding to address connectivity challenges exacerbated by the pandemic since early 2020. Let's be clear, prior to the pandemic lockdowns, we were living with a persistent digital divide that let, left others behind. Data showed that 16.5 million children, school-aged children, did not have access to adequate internet and computing devices at home. 42 million Americans did not have access to broadband. Nearly 1.3 workers lack the foundational digital skills they need to succeed. So, Within that context, the May 2020 COVID-19 lockdowns disrupted everyday life as we know it. Schools and businesses started to shut down and people were sent home to quarantine, exposing the digital divide to the world. According to Pew Research studies conducted during that time, 46% of parents from low-income households uh, said that their kids did not have that would experience tech related challenges in adopting distance learning. But that's when we experienced a seismic shift in what we viewed as important and doable. In the words of the great composer Duke Wellington, a problem is a chance for you to do your best. Amazingly, in a matter of months, we began to see key policy considerations and changes, the deployment of much needed devices to school children, and more importantly, new funding from Congress to accelerate these activities. So, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about this funding that was triggered by the, the, the pandemic. So if you don't mind, um, Ashley, launching the slides for me, please. Okay, so next slide. So in March 2020, Congress passed a $2 trillion corona, coronavirus, coronavirus aid relief and economic security, also known as CARES Act, which created the Coronavirus Relief Fund. It provisioned $115 billion for state, local, and tribal governments to address connectivity challenges that they were facing from the pandemic lockdowns. These funds were used to increase access to distance learning for school-aged children and college students to support telehealth services, deploy more than to deploy more public Wi-Fi access points and to invest in residential broadband infrastructure. Next was the Consolidated Dated Appropriations Act of 2021, signed in December 2020. It provisioned over $7 billion to help improve connectivity in the United States. And this provision included funding for a temporary emergency broadband program for low-income households and the newly unemployed due to the pandemic called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, overseen by the FCC. This program provided a discount of up to $50 per month for eligible consumers and $75 per month for those living on tribal lands. It also provided a one-time device discount for up to $100. Another program was the Connecting Minority Communities Pilot Program. 
this program was designed to help increase the the to increase the capacity of institutions that included historical black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and minority serving institutions. It helped to increase these institutions technology capacity and enhance their services as technology hubs in their communities. Additionally, the Consolidated Appropriated Act of 2021 also included funding for uh, tribal connectivity and telehealth programs also overseen by the FCC. In March 2021, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan Act, also known as APA. This included $10 billion for corona, corona, coronavirus capital project funds seven billion dollars for emergency connectivity fund the emergency connectivity fund was designated to help schools and libraries provide the tools and services their communities needed for remote learning during the covid 19 emergency period it also included the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds and lastly President Biden signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in December 2021 for $65 billion. It included funding for $42.45 billion for the broadband equity access and deployment called the BEAD program, $14.2 billion to make permit the emergency broadband benefits under the name Affordable Connectivity Program. And it also included $2.75 billion for the Digital Equity Act Program. Both these programs require states to, to develop state broadband planning and digital equity plans. So a quick review of the federal dollars flowing into communities in response to the pandemic really shows a great desire and motivation to lead to trigger recovery and forge a new path to addressing challenges that preceded the pandemic. Next slide, please. This slide is, illustrates the upsurge in federal funding, specifically targeting states, US territories and tribal governments to address the barriers to broadband adoption access and deployment. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for digital equity and inclusion. And if done right, it presents an opportunity for us to tackle historical challenges related to the digital divide and digital inequity. Next slide. So here's what we're likely to learn from the round table today. The COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns, mobilize private companies, nonprofits, associations, local and state and federal government to seek immediate solutions to the disruption, to disruptions in education, work and life. This resulted in some wins. Over, 19, over 9 million households enrolled in the emergency broadband benefit. Over 16 million households enrolled have enrolled in affordability connectivity program, though we have a, we still have a lot of work to do. 800 providers participated in the FCC's Keep America Connected Pledge. Public and private entities rallied to deploy computers, hotspots, Wi-Fi networks for students, even outside that federal funding. Over 50, 50 states, territories, and are in the process of developing state broadband plans and digital equity plans that are designed to move the needle for digital equity. Next slide. So today, the CEDC welcomes Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group, welcomes two fantastic panels to guide this discussion. I want to recognize I want to recognize the Digital Equity and Inclusion Working Group for putting together this tremendous um, agenda. Specifically, Dr. Harrison, the chair of the working group, 
Thank you to Vicki Robinson, Clay Bank, Clayton Banks, and Sarah Kate Ellis for leading the charge in planning today's event. Without further ado, I would like to in introduce our incomparable lead for the work stream, Clayton Banks, who will be moderating our first panel. And this first panel, as as our esteemed DFO mentioned, is the panel on availability and affordable affordability and deployment. Welcome, Clayton. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> what a great you, a great person you've been on this uh, journey for all of us. Uh, your leadership has been extraordinary. Uh, good morning, good morning, distinguished members of the FCC, led by our incredible chairwoman. Jessica Rosenworcel, our Communications, Equity, and Diversity Council, the, known as CEDC leaders and members, our incredible speakers that are here, and the esteemed guests listening in today. This is a great day. My name is Clayton Banks, and I'm the CEO of Silicon Harlem and a proud member of the CEDC. It is my honor to moderate today about the important lessons that we have learned from the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges and disruptions to our daily lives, as well as our businesses and industries. However, it has also taught us valuable lessons about the importance of preparedness, resilience, and adaptability. As we move forward, it is crucial that we take the lessons we have learned during this crisis and apply them to build a stronger and more resilient society. Our distinguished panel of speakers today, they're gonna to share those lessons learned from the pandemic on the topic of broadband connectivity of availability, affordability, and deployment. The outcome of this discussion will provide recommendations to the FCC, as Heather talked about, to advance digital communication for all. Now, we have several speakers and we're excited about that. And we want all of you to listen carefully to our conversation because this is a national challenge that we have and we are excited to make it happen. And again, um, our distinguished panel of speakers today will not only share their lessons, but they're going to actually provide some ideas of moving forward. And although we are panel one, there is also a panel two. <laughs> and following us, uh, there will be discussing adoption and digital readiness, and it will be moderated by Sarah Kate Ellis. So we're asking you to stay on for both of these panels. It's essential for your ears to hear this and to share with what we're doing. And I also want to recognize Vicki Robinson, who's uh, also one of our leaders on WorkStream 3, and uh, we are very appreciative of her uh, leadership in this as well. I will ask each panelist to provide a short introduction of yourself, starting with Miss Wynn, then Joshua Breitbart, Annette Taylor, Viorkia, Ovidiu, and Greta Byram and Broderick Johnson. So let's get this moving, right? Let's jump right in. Um, I will say, uh, Ms. Wynn, if you could do a very quick uh, introduction, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Clayton, for um, the, the introduction and setting up the panel. My name is Tun Nguyen, the Executive Director of OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates, the second oldest national Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander or ANHPI civil rights organization. Our membership-based organization has over 50 chapters and affiliates in 24 states with headquarters in DC, conducting a wide variety of community programs and policy and advocacy work to advance equity and opportunity for all ANHPIs. Thank you very much, Josh. Well, thank you, thank you, Clayton. Thank you to the commission for, uh, for forming the council and to the council for taking on uh, this subject. Uh, certainly an emotional one to look back on, but a critically important one. Um, I'm Joshua Breitbart. I'm senior vice president for Connect All at Empire State Development. 
and director of the Division of Broadband Access for the State of New York. Um, from 2015 uh, to July uh, 2020, I was senior advisor for, for broadband and then deputy CTO for broadband for the city of New York. Uh, so that was uh, during those uh, crucial first months of the pandemic when uh, New York City was the global epicenter. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, to join you today. Excellent. Uh, Annette Taylor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Clayton. And thanks also to the commission and to the council. I appreciate this conversation and being a part of it. Uh, I am proud to serve as the director of the Office of Digital Equity and Literacy within our North Carolina Department of Information Technology. Um, it's the first of its kind in the country, thanks to our governor, Roy Cooper, uh, who made it a priority. Um, obviously, we're focusing on affordable internet, digital literacy skills, and the devices, and of course, uh, the planning process for our comprehensive digital equity plan. Great to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I wouldn't be here without North Carolina. That's where my mom's from. So <laughs> we'll keep this going. Uh, so after Annette, we have uh, Vera Rica. Well, good morning, Clayton, uh, esteemed um, colleagues and guests. Um, thank you, the FCC staff and, uh, uh, and the commission for the opportunity to be on this panel and share our experience. My name is Ovidio Viorica. I'm the Broadband and Technology Program Manager with the Public School Facilities Authority um, and recently New Mexico Office of Broadband and Access and Expansion. I started my career over 25 years ago in the telecommunication industry. I work for a state agency helping schools since early 2000 um, on facilities and since 2014 with broadband infrastructure and connectivity. Our team just joined the New Mexico Office of Broadband Access and Expansion, um, office charged by, the, by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham uh, with the mission to connect everyone in the state, including students and teachers, tribal people, minorities, low income, people with disabilities, the list is very long. New Mexico has the interesting distinction um, of be being under a judge's order since April 2021 to provide devices and internet connectivity for at-risk students. And uh, that category includes native students, English language learners, students from low-income families, and students with disabilities. So uh, a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you again for being for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Uh, Greta? Hi, I'm Greta Byram. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited uh, to be here for this really important opportunity to share experiences from the pandemic. Um, I'm currently a principal at HRNA Advisors um, in the broadband practice there. Um, and I serve on the Regents Advisory Council on Libraries for the state of New York, as well as my local public library board in Beacon, New York, the Helen Public Library. Um, during the pandemic, um, I was running an organization called Community Tech New York, an organization I co-founded and um, working closely with the Detroit Community Technology Project um, and with the Southern Connected Communities Project in rural Tennessee. And um, that collective of organizations um, is focused on um, building collaborative community-owned broadband and digital equity ecosystems, including through broadband teaching tools, direct project support, um, and community organizing. So I'm really pleased to be here and um, excited to share my experiences. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we also have uh, Mr. Broderick Johnson. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Broderick Johnson and I'm Executive Vice President for Public Policy and also Executive Vice President for Digital Equity at Comcast Corporation. Uh, and in that capacity, I lead our company's unparalleled efforts to close the digital divide uh, and to bring about true digital equity. Thank you, Clayton, for leading this discussion and for your leadership and Heather and 
as well, and also uh, folks at the FCC uh, who have uh, who've really made this an incredibly rewarding experience to be involved in. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Broderick. We have uh, have had a great team over the over the time that we've been working on this. And so I just want to acknowledge our entire Workstream 3 team uh, for the CEDC. And the team has put together the questions that we will have uh, that we're going to be sharing today. Uh, so today it's a it's a several questions that we're going to go through. Not every question has to have everyone speak on, but there will be several that will require that. Um, Again, the theme is availability, affordability, and deployment. So let's jump right into our our actual questions. And um, I look forward to any questions that may be coming um, from the pop uh, from our population. All right, so the very first question we wanted to put on the table, um, and this will be one for all of you if you feel like you want to, you know, add your voice to it, is uh, what if any programs did you or your members or folks you work with implement during the pandemic regarding broadband availability, affordability, adoption, accessibility, and deployment? That is our question. What if any programs did you or your members implement during the pandemic regarding broadband availability, affordability, adoption, accessibility. So if you don't mind, I will call off the names um, to get started. And uh, Annette Taylor, if you don't mind to start and we'll go from there. Sure, I'll speak to the state of North Carolina, of course. Um, as has been repeated, the pandemic has shined a light on inequality. Um, it's something we all know. Our governor had already made closing the digital divide a top priority many years prior to the pandemic, uh, the Department of Information Technology uh, made strides in closing it by um, implementing or deploying our great grants, our state great grants. Those were already uh, beginning in 20, as, as uh, late as 2018, or as early as 2018, the broadband expansion grants. Um, and then our governor requested funding for affordability uh, in the state budget, um, although it did get cut. So we uh, certainly focused heavily on the emergency broadband benefit and then, of course, ACP, so pushing that. Um, and we really worked on pushing that through mailers. We partnered with state agencies like our North Carolina Department of Transportation, and we believe pushing that really made a difference and it has helped us, helped inform our efforts towards our outreach efforts with ACP. Excellent. Um, th that's really good information. We actually have one of our members helping to take a lot of, of uh, notes on this, uh, Louie. And uh, so thank you, Louie, for that. Uh, let me move on to uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, same question. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just uh, um, share a few sort of general observations first, and then I'll get very specific. Um, first, the, the investment in our network made sure that Throughout the pandemic, the broadband network worked for everyone. It didn't fail. There were no shortages. Second, at Comcast, in terms of affordability and adoption, we've been at this for more than a decade through our Internet Essentials program, which allowed us to address those needs immediately, uh, even before the government stepped to, up to the plate, which we're all so grateful for with programs like EBB and the ACP. Um, we launched our Lift Zones program and opened up our public hotspots across the country through through the pandemic, and they continue today. Um, from the start of 2020 through 2022, we built out an additional 2.7 million homes and businesses, and we'll add another million this year. But look, addressing cost and deployment alone won't solve the digital divide. We all know that. We need digital navigators. We need to invest in digital navigators, grassroots, community-based solutions. Uh, to close the digital divide. Now, specific to uh, to broadband availability, affordability, adoption, accessibility, and deployment. First, with regard to availability, um, we serve at Comcast. We serve entire communities with the same speeds and the same services. Availability in our markets was already ubiquitous. In terms of affordability, as I mentioned, we've been at this issue of affordability for over a decade, 
We started in an essentials in 2011. We never changed that price from 995 a month across more than a decade. We also though increased speed seven times and we doubled speeds during the early days of the pandemic. In terms of adoption, um, our Internet Essentials program has been more than just about helping people get online. It's also about skills training and low cost computers. As we know, those are important as well. In terms of deployment, um, our crews got back in the field as soon as it was safe to do that to continue building out more communities. And finally, with respect to access, and I want to address access perhaps a little bit differently, but we made sure that our products and services were more accessible to everyone. So, for example, in 2019, we partnered with Communication Service for the Deaf to offer ASL video chat options for Internet Essentials and our Xfinity uh, customers. And finally, I would say our Internet Essentials call center has, has access to translation services for 240 plus languages. So in terms of uh, access, we've uh, approached it that way as well. So let me ask a quick question, and that was a great, um, a lot of things built there that I think others can learn from. So sure. Comcast leading the way from that perspective. Was there anything that you had to adjust during uh, COVID? Because you guys already had done a lot of that before COVID, which is interesting. So I'm curious, was there any sort of differences that or outcomes as a result of the pandemic that we can all share all, as well? Well, certainly, and I'll use a, as an example, our um, Internet Essentials Partnership Program, IEPP. I'm realizing that, especially from with respect to education and the needs of students, that it was really important to get in into the schools and to be able to provide um, access to the Internet and to make awareness of our programs uh, even uh, more uh, more exemplary um, by going into school systems and working with school systems in, in order to do that. Second, I'd say with regard to our lift zones, again, realizing that there are so many millions of, of, of households not connected to the Internet, not so much because of uh, accessibility to the connections, but because of, of a lack of awareness about adoption. So we've opened up more than 1,200 uh, lift zones across the country. I think more than 1,250. These are community-based centers where Wi-Fi is accessible. Again, these have been very important for people who otherwise were enormously challenged to have broadband at home. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me move on to, uh, if you don't mind, to when uh, can you answer this or address this question as what, if any, programs did you or your members implement during the pandemic regarding broadband availability, affordability, adoption, accessibility, and deployment? Absolutely. Um, so as a community-based organization, we focus more on the adoption and accessibility side. Well, accessibility as it, as it um, impacts adoption, right? And so during the pandemic, um, we realized uh, we did a lot of in-language work during the pandemic because um, not just with, you know, the COVID-19 health uh, issue items that are coming out of the government that weren't given in Asian languages. Um, when EVB came out and then when ACP came out, there wasn't a lot of in-language support from the FCC side. So we, we did work with the FCC. We worked with our par tech partners like Comcast, Verizon Charter, T-Mobile, AT&T, et cetera, um, to make sure that uh, they are in language materials about how to get low in, uh, low cost internet um, options as well as like discounts on devices was really essential. So we developed it like in Asian language guides for our community. Um, in addition to that, like many of the API community are small business owners. And with the pandemic, they didn't realize, you know, digital literacy is, is part of, you know, the digital divide. Our community, while um, some may have access to devices and internet, they still have a huge gap in digital literacy. So we developed a workshop module that we presented um, through our OCA chapters for small business owners on like, you know, what are the mobile apps out there? What are the online business options for you to you know, get your food on a delivery delivery app, right? Or get your services online so that people can order from you, things like that. So, um, and and another thing too is that ANHPI students um, were 
part of this digital divide where many didn't have access to laptops. And before EBB came out, um, we actually went around uh, looking to see where we could get money and partnered with the Walmart Foundation to get um, a few hundred laptops out to NHPI students in Hawaii, California, Massachusetts, Washington State, um, because when they were sent home from school, not only did they not have reliable internet, they just didn't have a device. Um, and so those are some of the few things that we did during the pandemic. That is awesome. And you know, we're taking notes on all of this stuff. So this is very good. We wanna share this with the entire country of all of these things that the, the first three speakers already have you know, we can like close this whole thing down right now and go out to the world, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep this going. And, uh, I'll, uh, <clears throat> if you don't mind a video, if you could, uh, share the same question. Sure. Thank you, Clayton. Um, so, uh, New Mexico is a Western state. Um, it is rural, it is tribal, it is, has, um, many federal lands and more cows than people. We have wonderful vistas, uh, but we also have distances, uh, large, la large um, mass areas that um, could fit 13 New Hampshire's in it. And that is a, a difficult, a difficult uh, landscape to navigate in terms of broadband. Um, I want to, uh, to, to begin by uh, acknowledging that the Universal Service Fund um, in the E-rate program in particular, um, after 2014 modernization order, uh, has been essential to providing broadband access to students and teachers while in school. Uh, but we did not do enough as a country, as a state, uh, over the last decade to connect everyone else, especially students, teachers, when they are at home. So we were extremely unprepared for the, for the crisis. I heard from so many teachers that it was surreal to send in March 2020, send everybody, all the students home without mm. knowing if they had a device, if they had internet access, if they had any support from a technical perspective. So um, I'll give you an example of uh, an IT director from a small school, Bob Simpson uh, in Reserve, New Mexico, population 289. He is the IT director, but he also is a coach, drives the school bus, and he would be first to recognize that he is not a broadband expert. So we asked a lot of these folks overnight to pivot to full online delivery of instruction um, and possibly work, deploy MiFi hotspots, maybe they worked, maybe they didn't, Chromebooks, tablets, whatever they could put their hands on. Um, and it was heart-wrenching to, to hear and see the teachers lined up at the school with their students, uh, some of their students along the wall, right? Because that was the only place in a 10, 20 miles radius where connectivity could be found. So it was a, an all hands on deck, state agencies, communities, uh, nonprofits, internet service providers, um, taking advantage of the um, the ECF, the ACP, um, all the other programs that were the lifeline of uh, during that crisis. And they continue to be because we have to to do better. Uh, if if I am uh, if I have a message um, from this conversation for everyone out there is that this time around we better uh, we better get the job done, stay focused and utilize all the funding sources that Heather so um, so nicely presented. Uh, this is a uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to uh, to solve this problem once and for all, because um, it's probably not going to come around again. Well, th this is this is just great information. One of the things that we were very focused on at CEDC is to look at all of the country whether it's um, rural or in major cities, you know, we're trying to figure out, and it, it may not be one thing that will work for everyone, but if we can get all of the right results for all those type of areas, it's gonna be very important. Distance is, is definitely a challenge to your point, and I appreciate um, what you've shared with us as we'll keep going. Uh, Greta? 
Thanks. Yeah, it's been wonderful to hear everybody, the amazing work that everybody here has been doing. Um, I'm going to speak to three examples um, that I was involved in, one urban, one rural, and one surrounding libraries. So um, uh, the first example I want to talk about is grassroots Wi-Fi um, in Detroit and the Bronx. Um, so my group, Community Tech New York, along with the Detroit Community Technology Project, um, came together under the umbrella of the Community Technology Collective. And in the Bronx, um, we collectively built out 15 um, community hubs, Wi-Fi hubs. Um, those were using low-cost um, equipment. Um, we trained um, local people as digital stewards to install and maintain um, that equipment. Um, we set up solar charging stations and access points in church parking lots, as well as, um, you know, in places where people were seeking other social services. Um, we developed intranets so that um, there was some material that people could access. They didn't have to get all the way onto the the big internet. Um, they had there were neighborhood servers where people could access homework or um, announcements about emergency closures and such. Um, to the extent that we were charging anybody for service, we stopped charging um, during the pandemic. Um, and that was all an effort that was led in collaboration with um, faith-based organizations. Um, in Detroit, it was um, one church, Boulevard Harambe, um, a local community organization um, and local radio station, New CC, and Grace in Action, which is a youth worker collective. Um, in the Bronx, we were working with um, the Bronx Community Development Corporation and um, also worked with Silicon Harlem in these efforts. Um, and so, you know, these were kind of gap solutions, but meant a lot to folks on the ground. And um, I think um, there's a lot to learn about gap solutions and how they're developed collaboratively with the types of organizations which are not normally thought of as technology organizations, right? These are churches, these are community orgs. Um, so um, that's the kind of urban case that I, I wanted to bring. Um, in rural Tennessee and Appalachia, um, the Southern Connected Communities Project um, this is an unserved area, so um, a lot of folks are just um, getting access through satellite connections, um, which is very, you know, there's a lot of, um, it's low speeds and it goes out when it rains and things like that. So folks, um, or when there's heavy winds. So what we did there um, in collaboration with the Clear Fork Community Institute was we um, were able to use a modem to pull a cell signal um, to the community center and then from there build out again with low cost Wi-Fi equipment, build out um, community access. And that was really critical when the local clinic had to close. And so all folks had access to was um, actually this Wi-Fi network for healthcare. Um, so those are a couple of impactful examples. And then I just wanted to shout out libraries who kind of effort effortlessly rolled out many programs, um, Queens Public Library, for example, um, you know, they have over 25 Wi-Fi hubs across their service area. They, you know, served over 500,000 um, unique users in the year of 2020, um, distributed thousands of laptops and um, hotspot devices, and also provided um, help desk support, one-on-one -on -one support, and um, virtual programming, extensive virtual programming, 10,000 virtual programs in a dozen languages. Um, you know, book clubs, author talks, Zumba classes, story times, um, all of those things. And um, a 24-hour Black Health and Healing virtual summit 
to focus on issues including mental health, health equity, parenting, civil rights, racism, and the disproportionate effects of the virus. So just shouting out like amazing community efforts um, with, you know, really encouraging all of us to hold in our minds that, you know, it's not just technology organizations who show up to, to advance digital equity. It's all of these incredibly important players who show up in a crisis and who have those trusted relationships with communities that enable them to serve in that capacity. We cannot hear you. Like you're on mute. Just realized you're on mute, brother. My, and my commute, I'm muted all this whole time, right? First of all, I want to say it sounds like you went all over the country. I mean, there's so many different things that you uh, you shared with us was so important. Um, so thank you for that. And we're certainly going to probably come back on some of these things. But I want to get Joshua's voice, too. Of course, you know, New York was hit very hard during COVID. And um, he wasn't in that position that he's in now. He was in the position for the city of New York. So... Josh, can you talk a little bit about um, that question that we have on the board here? Uh, yes, and um, I just want to start by praising the colleagues uh, in the city of New York, uh, more than 300,000 public servants. Uh, incredibly proud to have been among that group in that time. Uh, particularly want to highlight the work of the Department of Information Technology and, and Telecommunications uh, that uh, you know, worked incredibly to maintain continuity of operations through that whole effort, uh, including working with the Department of Education to uh, uh, transition the largest school district in the country, over a million students, including my two children, uh, to uh, remote learning uh, in the course of a week, um, in, an incredible effort. I want to highlight uh, just one particular program uh, that we uh, ran out of the mayor's office of the chief technology officer uh, in partnership with the New York City Housing Authority, our public housing authority and Department for the Aging uh, called NYCHA Connected o Older Adults. Um, <clears throat> we worked, we had key vendor partnerships with uh, T-Mobile and Older Adults uh, Technology Services, um, uh, who's represented on the second panel. You may hear more about this project from them. Um, in the span of about five to six weeks, um, we'd identified a, a particular uh, vulnerable, vulnerable population at the time, uh, which were isolated seniors uh, living in public housing uh, during the during the lockdown. <clears throat> many of whom uh, did not have uh, an internet internet connectivity. Um, so we, uh, through that partnership, distributed uh, uh, internet connected tablets, uh, personalized tech support. Uh, each one um, and uh, in remote training to more than 10,000 of those uh, seniors uh, in, in public housing. Um, everyone really who um, was in that position who uh, requested a tablet. So <clears throat> they would receive a phone call uh, automated from the public housing authority. Um, they could um, so select that they wanted to uh, opt into this program. Uh, generally within three days, uh, UPS and, and um, Really praise to the you know, UPS workers uh, that that um, you know kept things going at the time and made this possible. <clears throat> uh, would uh, deliver the tablet uh, to their door, and they can get it no touch. Within um, two or three days after that, uh, if they hadn't already called in or set up the tablet themselves, they would receive a phone call from Older Adults Technology Services uh, and be guided into a remote training platform uh, that uh, that Oats that uh, organization had set up <clears throat> to connect them to training resources, including some of the library resources that Greta described, uh, or you know, whatever activity was critical to them, uh, staying in touch with their family, uh, accessing government services, including food and healthcare, uh, or staying in touch with uh, critical organizations, uh, including church services or, or anything that they needed to stay connected through that time. Um, and, and it really had an incredible impact uh, to, um, as you'll hear, I think, from uh, from Tom Camber, um, not just, uh, you know, as a just a means of, of survival and maintaining connectivity in an incredibly challenging time. 
Um, so that's just one project. But really, I think this discussion is a is a yes and because there's so many different efforts uh, going on, um, uh, you know, across the city, across the country. Let me unmute myself. Uh, <clears throat> you had me just gripped. So, <laughs> so it's really good. I'm actually going to move it along. The one question I just asked and all these answers, we could just shut the panel down at this point. I mean, you guys have already just, just really given some great information for the country here. However, I do want to ask, uh, I'm going to jump off, uh, I'm going to jump to a different type of question. Um, but very much related, which is looking back, right? So looking back to inform how we might look forward, right? So let's let's go to that question. Looking back to inform how we might look forward. What opportunities exist to address these challenges at scale? For example, to the extent that you believe that things like the EBB emergency broadband benefit and successor uh, ACP, the affordable connectivity program benefit, um, a successful, should these subsidies continue? And what if anything should be modified as part of extending these programs? So I will ask Josh, since you were already talking, I'd love for you to go ahead and try to address this question. Um, I'll give everyone who wants a chance to talk to this. You don't have to if you don't want to, but happy to hear anyone who wants to talk to this particular question. To this particular question. Uh, well, certainly the, the answer is the answer is yes, and I also would uh, praise the ISPs that um, are committed to not cutting anybody off from service in the immediate response, uh, and then those benefits were and have been and continue to be critically important in expanding access. I think another thing that we also saw was. Uh, it, it's vitally important to have uh, also a, a range of uh, community-driven, uh, mission-driven, community-based ISPs were critically important also uh, in the early response. So many stepped up uh, to uh, offer help in expanding connectivity. Uh, we used a, a partnership with um, the Housing Authority and the Economic Development Corporation of, the, of New York City, a rapid response uh, solicitation that allowed us to organize all those offers of help uh, to, um, to deliver services uh, at the time um, and continue those efforts to, um, to spread and, and um, partner with a variety of ISPs of all sizes uh, to um, deliver permanently affordable efforts. So I think, again, it's a, it's a yes and effort. Those are critically important, also important to have uh, key uh, partners that are mission driven uh, and to think about how to achieve uh, per permanently affordable uh, services to continue to expand uh, choice for, for all residents. Thank you for that, Josh. Um, uh, Ovidio, uh, New Mexico and the work you're doing out there, um, any response to that question? Absolutely. Uh, and. Um, if there is a, a big silver lining from the crisis is that we learned and relearned how to come together to solve problems uh, in an effective way, rapidly, right, immediately, right? Everybody pulled together and it's it's so heartwarming to, to hear all these, these stories. Um, but it, it will take more than that. It will take particularly um, not only the, the one-time cost, uh, but also for the sustainability piece, uh, some uh, some measure of subsidies will be needed uh, for uh, high cost areas. Those are rural uh, areas, tribal areas, um, even you know urban low income areas. Um, that that subsidy has to be there. Otherwise, uh, this is not going to happen, and th the same populations will be left on the on the wrong side of the digital divide if we do not have these resources in place. Um, so we have to work with these trusted institutions, um, anchor institutions, churches, um, schools, libraries, nonprofits. ISPs um, have an, a huge and important role to play, but they have to, to run businesses. They have to stay profitable. 
Um, so, so we have to recognize that, and we have to recognize that if rural uh, America is important to uh, to to our country, if tribal um, areas are important to to our country, then we have to invest in that for for the long term, uh, because the connectivity is uh, is the future. Um, they they have that. This is the only way um, that they they're, they will be able to thrive. So absolutely, the programs should should continue, particularly for Western states. Excellent. Two. Sorry, just looking for my unmute button, of course. But I think um, talking to the, the first part of the question about what opportunities exist to address the challenges at scale for us. I mean, we do a lot of civic engagement work as well, getting out the vote, getting out the count for the 2020 census and, and beyond. Um, and I think ACP outreach and, and adoption, getting all of our community members um, aware of what resources are out there is really important. And so for us, civic engagement and ACP outreach um, should go hand in hand. They do go hand in hand at OCA because what happens is that while we're asking, you know, many of the ANHPI community are limited English proficient or they are new immigrants. And so they don't know um, what are all the resources available to them for for them to get a low cost um, or, or a discount on a device, right? Or a low cost internet plan, or even, you know, you can use your subsidy um, on, on your current plan if, if it's higher. Um, in cost. And so doing ACP outreach along with knocking on someone's door asking that they vote yet is really um, a really easy way to further conduct like ACP and low cost internet outreach. And I think, you know, ACP needs to be continued. Um, you know, we, we ask that the federal government continue the program, of course, because beyond getting folks online, um, this program also helps people get devices. And we're doing a digital, an API digital access survey right now with over 7,000 responses across the country because um, there's a Pew Research uh, data floating around out there that says like, oh, 98% of Asian Americans have access to the internet. Um, but that that is part of this model minority myth because the data is not disaggregated. Many of our community, um, Southeast Asian, Pacific Islander communities are low income, are limited English proficient. And so we need to ask the questions of, what kind of internet do they have access to? And then how are they utilizing the internet? Are they really utilizing it to its fullest potential? And that goes back to Broderick's, um, you made a comment about digital navigators. Uh, that's also something that we need in our community, right? And so um, right now we're seeing we, in, in about our 5,000 English um, survey responses, 14% of, of the respondents are saying that they only have a cellular um, access uh, to internet at home, which you know that's not an effective way to do school work, to apply to jobs, um, get government benefits. And so um, this program is, is really important and needs to be continued. Yeah, if I could ask a question before Greta gets on here. Um, did you did you use the term API that there's a what were you talking about? Uh, yes, Asian American Pacific Islander. Yeah, API. Yes. Oh, OK. You know, it's a tech phrase too. So I was, I was, <laughs> right, right. you had me there. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Greta. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to point to a report that was released by the Benton Foundation on Friday um, where they found in a survey that over half of or half of uh, uh, ACP eligible households are still unaware of the program. Um, and they also tied that to digital skills. And so I think, you know, the more likely that folks have digital skills, the more mm -hmm. likely they are aware of ACP and um, want to sign up. Um, and their primary recommendation is to collaborate with trusted local institutions and communities, which is really a theme. Um, so I want to just, number one, say that um, we should not be addressing digital equity um, needs sort of one by one, but rather looking holistically at um, both boosting digital skills, understanding the outreach that works for for different communities, and you know getting ACP awareness out there. Um, and then the second thing I want to say is 
we are asking these local anchor institutions to play a role and really to leverage their trusted relationships with the communities. And that's really important to remember in terms of the sustainability of the program, because we don't want to leave those institutions on the hook um, if the program changes. Um, it's very important to set them up um, in a way that protects um, their, their um, trust trustworthiness within the community. Excellent. Um, does anyone else want like to, um, to, to comment on this? Yes, Clayton. Okay, like so I see, I see your head's not nodding. So <laughs> I'll go with I'll go with Broderick and then me? and then Annette, you bring us home to it. All right. Go okay. Ahead, yeah, um gonna uh, gonna say what uh echo what's been been uh sung by the choir here. Um I think that uh, as you know, for example, as 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 Obi said at the outset, and we all say this constantly, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. There are unprecedented uh, billions of dollars uh, that have been invested in both uh, deployment projects, but also, of course, around adoption through ACP and before that EBB. But we still we know that only about a third of eligible households for ACP have signed up. It's about 17 million people. That's great, but there are tens of millions others uh, to uh, to get to. Um, ACP adoption rates in the states vary. Uh, in my home state of Maryland, I know the new governor's committed certainly to this, but in Maryland, 20, only 27 percent of eligible households have signed up to ACP. There's a lot of work to do there. In Louisiana, on the other hand, 47%. So collaboration, governors working together, all of us working together to increase those those rates. Uh, we need policymakers then to, again, be really focused on awareness to drive adoption. And then we need to, of course, continue to scale what works. And uh, Greta, I love coming to Detroit. Uh, I'm a University of Michigan uh, crazy alum. I don't know if you are, but I am. <laughs> but I love going going to Detroit and and one of my most favorite moments over the past year was visiting a place called St. Patrick's Senior Center in Detroit, a fabulous di digital navigators program, which we we support. And there we were seeing how seniors were navigating the Internet to set up their email accounts and to order groceries online and to make video calls, of course, to their family and friends to have birthday celebrations, for example, throughout the pandemic. We need to look for opportunities to scale all of that work because we know those things make a big difference. I was also in Houston this past year, and, and we, sh we shouldn't always assume that, of course, we know what it is that people need when they go on the internet. In Houston, I met a gentleman, 90-year-old gentleman, who was so happy in his digital navigator class because he was able to stream gun smoke every day. And for him, that was, for those of you who perhaps are too young to know what gun smoke was, a very famous television show, and watching the reruns made this gentleman very happy. So education, yes. Economic mobility, yes. Telehealth, yes. But also even, I'd say, more basic things to keep people very happy and satisfied about their lives are important. Great. Thank you, Broderick. So <clears throat> we're going to get back to a little bit more of that. But certainly right now, let's hear from Annette Taylor. Sure, I'll wrap up the conversation on that. I could not agree more with my panelists here that yes, ACP is important to continue. Um, the recurring theme has also been about partnerships. I think that partnerships is what has led North Carolina to be in, at over 700,000 of the 1.3 million that we are aware of. You know, it's all about the data and where that comes from and what's being defined by that. But understanding that there are 1.3 million right now that are eligible and we have over 700,000. The partnership I described earlier, working with Department of Transportation, our DMV, getting the word out through the channels that they already use, working with our school systems, the Department of Public Instruction and getting the word out uh, through our free and reduced lunch program and just putting it out there from the initial onset. Also, our governor um, has asked the service providers to offer a discounted program so that those who already qualify for ACP at the $30 rate, they would be able to get it for free. 
Um, and I think that some of the policies that should occur is, I agree with you on the digital navigation program. We need a standardized program, but we're excited in North Carolina that we're creating our own statewide digital navigator program. Uh, we are also going to be working with the hotline service so that people can get the type of support they need. And that support, I mean, it, it can range from how, how to even get recertified. Um, it Once they initially qualify, did they move forward to the next step? What type of challenges did they have? And having those digital navigators go back and say, did you actually go through with it? Because we all know what some of the challenges are when it comes to that step two. Uh, so, you know, I just wanted to shout those things out and agree with everybody that collaboration and partnership with state agencies, community-based organizations, um, our libraries. Um, and so here in North Carolina, we're still leveraging our ARPA funds to invest in digital navigator programs across the state. That was very, very good information here. Um, and, and appreciate what you have shared in that and everyone else. Uh, like I said, I mean, this is, to me, this is a, a nationwide conversation. And we're hearing it from so many different perspectives, but there's some real commonality here. So I'm I'm so excited to keep this moving. Here's the next question. <clears throat> so uh, as I'm thinking through what I'm hearing, there's a few things that I want to that I hope that we'll be able to address. So one of them is, and we'll do that now. <coughs> excuse me. How are you prepared for future pandemic type events? I mean, how are you prepared right now? Anything done differently in light of this COVID-19 experience? How are you prepared for the next disaster? Josh, <laughs> help us understand with that. Well, <clears throat> um, uh, first, I also just want to uh, thank the FCC for the outreach grants for the uh, for the affordable connectivity program. Uh, we've we've reached uh, almost 1.2 million uh, people in New York uh, with the program, but the the next uh, million or two million are harder to reach, uh, and so investing in those efforts are are critically important. Um, I think we are keeping these lessons in mind as we implement the Connect All. Uh, program uh, in New York, um, uh, investing a billion dollars in broadband infrastructure and digital equity uh, across the state. Um, one key consideration is investing in government capacity. So um, it, when we look back a few years, I think it's hard to remember that uh, New York City was one of the few uh, local governments that had an office dedicated uh, to connecting residents to the internet. Um, now it's something that many have, um, maintaining efforts from the pandemic and every state, every state and territory has a state broadband office uh, to implement federal broadband programs. Uh, that needs to be an enduring capability. Uh, and we have a program to invest in uh, government capacity, municipal infrastructure and assistance program. I think we see that there's a range of ways to be more active for government. Some want to uh, own infrastructure or be an ISP. Uh, some just want to be a more active, dedicated partner with uh, community-based organizations uh, or ISPs uh, to make sure that uh, everybody has service and the support that they need. Um, but it's a consistent refrain. We need to make sure that, um, that we maintain that capability after this one-time uh, uh, funding um, uh, sunsets. Um, another aspect is really thinking about the entire ecosystem and making sure that we've got the kind of partnerships that came together in emergency response, uh, we should continue to, to invest and strengthen those. So as we implement our uh, digital equity uh, plan and, uh, and grant program, uh, we are working with uh, digital equity coalitions that include digital literacy and equipment providers, community anchor institutions, community-based organizations, and frontline service organizations, uh, and um, ISPs, including mission-driven, locally-based ISPs, uh, along with government uh, to shape that plan, uh, but also those relationships really need to endure. <clears throat> and then I think third, uh, to, to, um, uh, to consider the recovery that makes us more resilient is to think about the widespread economic opportunities that come <clears throat> with the investment that we're making. Uh, something we tried to do uh, from the city level and is something that we're uh, very much thinking about as we um, make those uh, investments across the country uh, using recovery funds uh, to increase economic opportunity, uh, choice, uh, permanent affordability, uh, particularly in pandemic-impacted communities, 
Um, we're doing that, including through partnerships with housing providers and our affordable housing connectivity program. So I, I, I want to really, again, praise our federal partners, uh, Congress, Treasury, Commerce, the FCC. Uh, it's an excellent set of tools. Uh, and really now, I think states have a critical role in, um, in applying those tools in a way that um, gives us a strong recovery that uh, in is inclusive and makes us more resilient to anything that can come in the future. Let me, <clears throat> well, I appreciate what you, you said. It's very, very good information for all of us. And I would assume that everyone sort of agrees with what they're saying. I want to move over to Annette Taylor. If you want to address this particular question that we're talking about, are you prepared for future pandemic type events? <laughs> Anything done differently in light of the COVID-19 experience? That's, that's a, that's something uh, I'd love to hear from you. And if anyone else on the panel wants to talk to this, put your hand up and I'll know. Sure. Thanks, Clayton. I, like Joshua, want to thank and praise our uh, federal and state policymakers um, on uh, being in agreement and putting the thing, the resources and investments in place to move us and uh, allow us to even have had lessons learned. Uh, I want to speak to one particular entity that I'm proud that our state has and that is our North Carolina Business Committee for Education. Uh, they already focused on work-based learning and connecting uh, students to um, technology opportunities and connecting employers uh, to students with skills. Uh, but when this pandemic happened, they jumped into place and leveraged their partnerships with the corporate sector. It's the corporate sector that jumped in along with private and you know private and public philanthropy, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations to get those devices to the students in the school and create a remote learning work group. So not only were the resources put in place with the schools all across the state, but also the learnings from them. And what we know about those learnings is how those students was able to use it, how they weren't, what the capacity, what challenges they had. And so we have reports that talk about, uh, you know, what happened as a result of that, what type of future resources need to be put in place. And so I would say to that, you know, just understanding more about the appropriate type of devices that uh, families and household need for what their needs are. Um, it's not just a matter of giving someone a smartphone, which we know does not have all the capabilities, uh, but all household need uh, laptops and, and computers because there are certain things you just can't do with it. And I think, um, I don't know if it was uh, uh, Broderick or uh, Two said this earlier that um, we understand that there are seniors in the households. The seniors in the household, they had they were isolated. We know we have to attend to them now. One of the biggest uh, social things that our seniors do every week, all of us do it, but is, is go to church. And that is where our senior population, our aging population, uh, that is where they were most affected. And then whether they could not get online and experience the church. We know they already could not be together with their friends and their family members, but we also had the churches who they could not actually have that uh, remote access. If they didn't already do it, then it was an even bigger challenge. Those are some of the areas that we're gonna be focusing on, uh, not just in learning and, and documenting in our digital equity plan, but also leveraging existing funds that we have uh, to support community-based organizations that are going to be working with these covered populations that we know are all part of the Digital Equity Act. You know, I like the, <clears throat> by the way, everyone has their hand up. So I, I don't, I got that, all right? So we're gonna get to that. Um, but I like this digital equity plan. Is that something that you're gonna share around the country? Is that something that you guys would be willing to make sure that that, you know, becomes something that we all can uh, benefit from? As we know, all the states are working on their comprehensive digital equity plan. Five year on North Carolina had received the 1.4 million uh, for digital equity part. And then our broadband infrastructure office received 5 million. So totally we're working with 6.4 million to put together a plan. Uh, that plan has to be shared publicly and get public comments before it is submitted to NTIA um, to see what future um, investments are made in the state. So uh, we're really excited about the process that we are um, executing uh, to make that plan a reality. Thank you very much. Let me let me go to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't mind, if you go to Broderick, you had your hand up, and then we'll get to everybody else. 
course, let me observe. We could have this panel for another two or three hours. So I don't know. I how, know that's right. <laughs> how busy everybody else is, and and I'm learning so much from other people as well. We're not just you know sort of um, preaching to the choir here. That's for sure because we're sharing a lot of important things about what we've been we've been able to do. You know, I think you know first what we have learned, and as we go forward, we should keep in mind is that again in this country, um, our broadband networks worked throughout the pandemic. Challenges, though, for so many people was that they didn't know how they could get online or they didn't have the devices or they didn't know how to use the devices. And as we look forward, you know, look, we'll continue at broad at Comcast to invest in the network. We've made 20 billion dollars plus in investments over our in our network over the last five years. We continue, though, to be very committed specifically, of course, to digital equity and achieving that. So we've put another billion dollars looking forward into the types of programs that we know achieve digital equity. We will continue to offer Internet Essentials and Internet Essentials Plus, which for millions of folks is, you know, can be free now as a result of the ACP. Um, the programs we've done in partnerships with schools will continue. We need to continue to invest in what works, and we have pretty good ideas of what works. We'll continue to invest in digital navigators. And that's what I, again, want to stress is really important, is the awareness. We all know that trust is a huge factor. It mattered during the pandemic in terms of people getting vaccinated. It's mattered throughout uh, efforts to get people to, to, uh, to register to vote and to actually vote. We know that that critical though, to all of that are trusted voices. And so we're well situated for the next pandemic in terms of broadband and access. But we need to make sure, of course, that millions of our friends and neighbors, people in our communities are signed up. Thank you, Broderick. <clears throat> really, uh, it's this is building and building and building. Everyone's building on top of each other. I love this. This is going to make a big difference. Um, so let me let me go to two, and then uh, we'll have a video after that. Uh, thanks, Clayton. Actually, Broderick basically summarized what I was also going to say is that um, for OCA, I think we're we're prepared for the next pandemic. Thanks to during this pandemic, having built those partnerships between government, private sector, and then acting as trusted voices in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, A and HPI. Um, you know, I think for us too, a key point is the intergenerational relationships. Um, OCA focuses a lot on developing youth leaders. And I think a part of that too, I mean, our youth, e even if you're not youth, right? If you if you are, if you have any elders in your home, you are the digital navigator at home, right? And so part of um, the the ACP outreach, the digital literacy work, it has to be done also intergenerationally. And so um, for us, it's not just focusing on getting folks signed up, but also bridging like intergenerational understanding on how to like help your um, friends and family get online and navigate and use devices. And so just all of these relationship building pieces that we've really strengthened and worked upon during the pandemic, um, we're, we're prepared for, for anything um, to come. Excellent, excellent. No, we, we're, we're, we're happy that there's so many coordinations here. Um, <clears throat> so video. Thank you. Um, and panels, yes, what what a wonderful discussion. Um, I, I love to to hear about this intergenerational um, effort because we we have something similar in New Mexico. Teeners where teens are helping seniors um, uh, navigate the, um, the the digital revolution that that we're we're going through right now. But different parts of the country, um, face different challenges as well. Um, and I would say from, from the New Mexico perspective, from Western states perspective, we learned a lot, we accomplished a lot during the, uh, the COVID crisis, but I'm not sure we are prepared, not yet, uh, because we don't want to, to go back uh, the next crisis and park the school buses uh, equipped with Wi-Fi in mobile um, cells in low income neighborhoods or have the kids 
um, sit on top of the hill um, for uh, for eight hours because that's where their MiFi uh, is is working. Um, you know, miles away from their house or uh, or or whatever. Um, so. Uh, the Treasury and the bead um, investments will help tremendously. Probably not enough money to get the, all the job done, but uh, it's a significant down payment, a significant leap forward. Um, but we need to better use the existing infrastructure and build new infrastructure that is resilient. Um, new Mexico just went through the largest uh, wildfire in its history, 500 square miles um, uh, burned uh, and the the local communities already distressed are um, are further distressed and definitely the infrastructure is uh, is has to be rebuilt. So and that is going to take time. So we have to to establish predictable programs um, to build the infrastructure that is needed. That takes you know three five years. It takes a, a long time. Uh, but then build in the sustainability to make sure that um, those uh, th th those connections, those networks um, uh, will will still be there in 10, 20 years and so on. Um, and uh, and we have to build these structures and working relationships to make sure that all this work happens uh, in, in an orderly and in a diligent fashion. And it will take all of us. It will take the federal government, it will take the state government, it will um, uh, it will take the local leaders. It will take the uh, the trusted partners at the local level. It will take all of us to to make this happen. And we have to stay focused because uh, otherwise um, we are going to go back to the 2010 experience where we said we are going to to solve this problem, and lo and behold, we didn't. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Vidya. Uh, it's amazing that. Uh... All of you, I guess, have been pent up. There's a lot of coming out of this, this already. We're so excited about it. I know, Greta, you want to have something to say, so we'll we'll turn over to you, and Josh, you'll have something to say as well. So, Greta, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I just wanted to mention all of those innovative gap solutions that I talked about at the top uh, in, in Detroit and the Bronx. Um, these were actually responses to previous crises and emergencies. So looking back, um, Superstorm Sandy in New York and the you know massive recession in Detroit um, <clears throat> both led to the need to create innovative grassroots solutions. However, when the crisis is over, for the moment, um, those innovative solutions don't get funded. Like these are things that get emergency funding, but not um, interim funding. And so just wanna remember that if we want these kinds of things to progress beyond being gap solutions, um, we have to remember churches, food banks, um, direct service organizations, schools, and libraries. When there's not <laughs> a crisis, um, and we have to continue to see those institutions as critical to advancing digital equity. Um, and I'm saying that right now because library budgets are being slashed right now. And when we look at the impact that libraries had in the pandemic, um, we really need to, um, you know, bring bring forward their incredibly nimble capacity to um, bring connectivity, bring devices, um, do outreach for ACPs, um, training, programming, all of that. Um, and it's not just libraries, but I'm I'm speaking about libraries in particular because of budget concerns. Uh, Clayton, you're on mute. I'm so speechless that my mute just op automatically happens. But now let me tell you something. That is some deep stuff you're talking about, Greta. You know that you know that preparation is going to include a lot of different aspects. So uh, that was that was something that I really needed to hear myself. Josh, did you want to um, make any other comment about this? Any other comment about this? Well, yeah, and I and I think many have touched on this, but that's exactly right. Is that the we we don't know the specifics or the shape. Of the of the next disaster that might come, but what we do know for sure now is that connectivity will be a critical component of uh, surviving it, responding to it, and recovering from it. 
Uh, and so that is something we have to keep in mind in preparing not just for a, uh, a future pandemic that I hope never comes, uh, but other things, um, you know, like like wildfires, natural disasters, or, or others. And um, I think, you know, too, you, you spoke to this, the, um, you know, strengthening those personal relationships uh, at the community level is so critical. Uh, I was just uh, in Buffalo at one of our digital equity listening sessions, and a community organization was talking about how when the pandemic hit, people that they were regularly in touch with, just because they showed up the same meeting every week, the same location, once that stopped, they basically lost contact with them. Now through ACP outreach, uh, through other types of engagement efforts, uh, we can repair those fractured relationships. Uh, and again, you know, really um, just want to, to praise the New York State Legislature, Governor Hochul, all our federal partners for delivering the resources uh, to, to get this done. But ultimately we really have to work with our local partners uh, who are going to achieve and maintain uh, those relationships to, to connect people, to keep them connected uh, both um, digitally and socially. Excellent, excellent to put a put a nice cap on this. I want to uh, acknowledge that there is a comment slash question to you, uh, Broderick. I don't know if you see it in the chat. Um, and I haven't read it all together. It sounds like they're asking you to give her a billion dollars, but <laughs> I don't know. But okay. if you could look at this. Um, I'll take it under advisement. I, I can't, I don't see the billion dollar request in here, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, I'll try take to a read it. of it. I'll ask a question for the team right here, but ask, uh, take a look at the question uh, or the comment and uh, perhaps, you know, you can handle it the way that you. Oh, I see. I it. see it here. Yeah, I see it here now. Okay. Okay. I'll so, again, I'll take it under, I'll take it. I'll send it back to the folks in Philadelphia. Excellent. Excellent. Have, yeah. Then we can keep moving then. Yeah. So the next question I wanted to, we, we're coming to our time, be honest with you, believe it or not. So <laughs> we can, like you said, we could go on for a, a several more hours, but we are respectful of the next panel. Um, so I'm going to just have two questions, Jamila and Beth Johnson. I'm only have two questions left and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, so we'll, let's try to make these last two questions, you know, somewhat quick responses. So one of them is, um, it, it, actually, let me just go with one. What do you need from the federal government, the private sector, or community organizations to advance the work you are doing? You guys all are doing incredible work. What do you need from the federal government? What do you need from the private sector? What do you need from the community? and all of that to advance the entire work that we're doing. Who wants to go first? Why don't we start, uh, well, it makes sense to me to start with Greta. You've been talking about all these things. So give me your uh, your response to that. Uh, I, you know, I just would reiterate what I just said a couple minutes ago of uh, remember these institutions, um, the on the ground institutions, which you don't maybe think of as digital equity or um, technology organizations, they are the key and critical bridge. And we need to think about uh, building their capacity in the, for the long term to serve that role of connecting and building trust with local communities um, between emergencies. Um, so I just would say that again <laughs> and again and again and again. Um, good. No, that that's good. That's good. Anyway, put your hand up if you want to comment on this. Uh, Broderick, go ahead. A yeah, physical I I hand, know. not just a yellow hand. That was good. A physical hand <laughs> came up. I guess I'm old school sometimes. What can I say, <laughs> right? <laughs> I guess in terms of what do we need from the federal government and how we can all continue to work together. First, with regard to government, I'd say first, uh, with the tens of billions of dollars in infrastructure money available for deployment, it, it should be focused on where it needs, where it's needed, which is in much of the rural parts of, of the country where deployment is still, of course, um, um, lacking. And there are, again, it's a lot, once a lifetime opportunity to be able to address that, both government resources and private resources. Second, you know, the ACP 
is uh, extraordinarily important, as we all know. Um, but we have to make sure, and government can play a key role in this, in making sure that those who get uh, government funds to help with uh, ACP awareness are actually out there signing people up uh, and working with trusted organizations to, to do that. We need Congress and the administration to work together to extend ACP. It will run out of money, and that shouldn't be allowed to happen. Right? This is such an important, important um, you know, life-changing program, as we know, for so many tens of millions. And I would say this finally, that all of us need to work. You know, Greta had, had acknowledged that it, in mentioning the emergency, that we're kind of beyond the emergency that we were in, at least the beginning of the pandemic and through, through the first year or so. Um, but that doesn't take away the need for a sense of urgency. Right? We, we can't let up. Right? And at the same time, we have to be patient. May seem like a bit of an oxymoron, but we have to be patient because those who are hardest to help get aware of, awareness to, and to get devices and to learn how to be digital literate, digitally literate, for those Americans we can't leave behind. Uh, but we have to be patient in how we address their needs and their, you know, their lack of trust for government or the lack of awareness. So those would be the things that I would emphasize most in terms of what the government and all of us working together can do. Um, to make this truly successful. Excellent. Thank you so much. We're going to go to a video, a video, and then also to. So, video, you go first. Yes, absolutely. Um, first, uh, I'll echo that we have to continue the funding, um, and um, that that funding for rural, for tribal, for low-income areas. Uh, this funding is a must. Uh, and establish predictable programs because we we can't just have you know one time here and one time there uh, and expect people to turn on a dime um, and and do wonders. These are long term investments, and that investment has to continue. Um, I would say the federal government should um, continue to engage with states directly and emphasize local engagement and partnerships uh, because they know what the, their community needs best. Uh, and they all bring value and important perspectives and resources, honestly. Um, and the federal government also can uh, remove obstacles, um, such as um, streamlining permits, uh, simplifying or, or ask folks to simplify um, the deployment of infrastructure um, attached to utility poles and, and so on. There are so many uh, in, in the West, uh, there are so many federal agencies that are involved in the permitting process and that slows down uh, progress tremendously, significantly, um, because they're understaffed. Honestly, that's that's the reason. They, they have to deal with a lot of work um, and um, allow communities to, to be part of the solutions. But, um, you know, it starts with funding. And and again, we, we cannot fun, only fund a one time in the crisis. We have to uh, to make the funding predictable and continuous because that's what's going to take. Um, and we'll have to stay focused and get the job done. Excellent, excellent. Now we're, we're, we're getting a somewhat of a, I don't know, everybody's on the same track here. Let's go to two, and then we're going to go to Annette. Yeah, I mean, I just have to say it so that it's on the record and that there are receipts, but <laughs> just want to say internet and, and access to broadband is a need, not a want, and so ACP needs continued funding. Um, and then also just resources for in-language support, right? I think um, we were doing, you know, the government either needs to set aside resources for in-language support or give resources to the community organizations uh, providing the in-language assistance because we can't do it um, for free for, for too long, um, but ACP funding for sure. Thank you so much. Annette? Sure, I'll keep it simple as you wrap up, Clayton. I echo all of what was said, uh, especially um, the uh, partnerships, of course, the feedback, because we need the feedback so that we can come up with the best state plans. Uh, we need the uh, we need the uh, the investments. We cannot forget the investment, but let's not forget data sharing, okay, between all of these different groups, the federal government, the private sector, uh, our ISPs, um, the community organizations, because uh, we need to be able to make sure that we are addressing the appropriate solutions for the appropriate 
uh, populations that we're all trying to serve. And so, um, you know, we just need to be able to best track our current state of things in the state. And that's important in order for us to make sure we understand what the impact of all of this work that's going into this. Um, and also, obviously, just to be able to best um, provide solutions for our residents. Uh, so uh, thank you for the opportunity, Clayton, and look forward to continuing to work with you all. Well, I, as a result, we are at time, um, and I am just so grateful to have had this great opportunity. I want to thank everyone on the call for panel one and a big virtual hug to our speakers for their service to the country today. I believe that by working together, we can leverage the lessons learned from this pandemic to create a more equitable, connected, and resilient society. Thank you, Chair Rosenworcel, for this incredible opportunity to share this important topic. And thanks for everyone that's been on this call this entire time. Thank you so much. Get ready. Get ready for panel two. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. And, and Clayton, I, I just want to say that uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And the, the videotape of it will be posted on our CEDC website, uh, www.fcc.gov. We're going to pause momentarily for a brief break in the roundtable. Please come back at 1145, and we'll be doing panel two on adoption and digital readiness. Thank you, everyone, from panel one. Thank you. Well, hello, this is Sarah Kate Ellis. Um, I'm the president and CEO of GLAAD. I am moderating panel number two. And panel number two is about adoption and digital ready readiness. I'm really excited. I hope you all were watching panel one. They did an amazing job. And I think we're gonna have um, an insightful and interesting and informative conversation now. I want a couple of house rules. I just wanna start by actually thanking Clayton for the first panel, that was excellent. And I wanna thank the commission and the council for all the work that got us here today. A um, couple of ground rules, acronyms, few of those popped up in panel number one, and let's assume no one knows what you mean. So please just define them. I'll stop you along the way. Number two is that you can submit questions by email during this event to livequestions at FCC.gov. Um, that's livequestions at FCC.gov. All right, well, let's get started. We're gonna start with announcing all of our panel um, folks, and then they're gonna come in and tell you what their role is. So first we have Norma Fernandez. Norma, can you unmute yourself? Thanks. Thank you for the reminder. Good morning, everyone. My name is Norma Fernandez. I'm the CEO of Everyone On. We're a national nonprofit that has been working on the digital divide for a number of years. Excited to be joining you all today and part of the conversation. Next, we have Thomas Camber. Uh, good morning, or I guess good morning to people even in the other uh, time zones out there. Um, I'm Tom Camber. I'm the executive director of Older Adults Technology Services, uh, OATS from AARP, and we do technology programs for older adults all around the country um, and operate seniorplanet.org and programs at senior planet centers and partnership sites around the country. So um, I'm really excited to be here today as well. Wow, we have an all-star panel. Next, we have Hal Woods, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Hal Woods, Chief of Policy at Kids First Chicago. We are actually an education uh, nonprofit uh, here in Chicago, but we worked on a digital divide uh, program, Chicago Connected, uh, that I'll be excited to share with folks uh, today. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks for being here. That's going to be really interesting. Anissa Green. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denisa. I'm with AT&T, 
and I'm happy to be here. I work on uh, affordability and um, digital divide issues for our federal regulatory team. That's great. Um, Jisoo. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jisoo Song, uh, serving as a digital equity advisor here at the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. My role is to collaborate with agencies across the federal government, including the wonderful folks at the FCC, to help maximize the reach of programs and policies that support broadband access and digital equity for our learners. Um, our office, OET, so Office of Educational Technology, sits within the policy office at the Department of Education, and our role is to um, set that national vision for how technology can be used to transform teaching and learning. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here. And I'll give, um, did Stephen Adams make it in? I can't see all, oh, yay. Hi, Stephen. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Stephen Adams, uh, President and CEO of uh, Virgin's Next Generation Network. We're the middle mile um, carrier for the entire Virgin Islands and all the ISPs uh, use our services to get from the islands to the states and in between. That's great. That's going to be really interesting. So let's start with you, Norma. Our first question um, is probably going to be around Robin. And um, if any panelists want to jump in also and don't feel like they're being heard, please raise your hand. Um, I'm paying very close attention. So let's start with question number one. What, if any, programs did you or your members implement during the pandemic regarding broadband adoption and digital reg readiness? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so for a little context, everyone on, as I mentioned, is a national organization and we have local reach in a number of communities across the country, including Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Milwaukee, El Paso, and a number of other um, cities um, where we do a number of things. One is drive awareness of an adoption of low cost or subsidized internet offers like the Affordable Connectivity Program. We donate computers to families in need, in particular K through 12 households, and we also provide digital skills training. So we're really keen on making sure that folks not only have the tools in their household, but also make sure that they know how to utilize it. So have that comfort level and that confidence to really leverage the power of technology at home. And so we were doing a lot of this work prior to pandemic, but since the pandemic unfolded, we did a couple of things to really expand our reach and our impact. One is that we started offering more capacity building trainings to diverse organizations. Previously, we had done extensive work with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, working with public housing agencies across the country, sort of helping develop their capacity around how to deliver or how to design and deliver digital inclusion programs. Since the pandemic, we expanded the capacity building training to ensure that we were also reaching libraries, other nonprofits, advocacy organizations, because as we all saw, a number of organizations that had not been doing this work all of a sudden found themselves needing to ensure their families were connected, had devices and training. So we were in an excellent position to be able to package our training, if you will, and offer it to a number of organizations. We've trained well over 300 organizations in a matter of a couple of years, and that number is growing, especially now with all the attention around the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP. In fact, just last week, we hosted a training for organizations in Los Angeles, over 45 attended, who are now going to go out and not only know about ACP, but also start spreading the word about it. So that's one key thing that we did. The other was that we pivoted to deliver our digital skills training in a virtual format. So, of course, we couldn't uh, you know, deliver it in person. So we worked extensively with our um, nonprofit partners again across the country to be able to deliver our trainings virtually. So you can imagine that wasn't an easy fit, uh, feat, I should say, right? Trying to figure out how do we get devices to people's how do, you know, where do we set them up so they can participate in the training? We developed a structure that allowed us to deliver the training um, virtually and it's been very successful. That's amazing. I think something really interesting that maybe we can surface here as well is how do you scale that eventually? Um, so Hal, I'll turn to you now. Same question. Um, what did you implement during the pandemic uh, regarding broadband adoption digital readiness? Thank you, Sarah. Kate, um, so it's a little over a year ago, almost to the day, or I should say three years ago to the day. Uh, so on March 13th, 
2020, uh, Chicago Public Schools, which is the fourth largest school district in the uh, in the country, uh, went fully remote. Uh, school was shut down. Uh, Kids for Chicago. So again, we're an education nonprofit advocacy organization, but we reached out to about 200 parents in our network, and we said, "What are the biggest issues that you're facing right now?" And continued uh, continued conversations uh, revealed that lack of broadband internet adoption at home was one of the top issues. So even though we traditionally do more sort of education policy issues. We knew that we needed to uh, to research the issue. We found that about one out of five kids in the city of Chicago did not have uh, broadband at home, primarily in the city's hardest, uh, hardest, uh, the highest hardship communities as well. Mm. So this re we re released a report uh, to kind of elevate the issue, put a number to it, and also come up with some recommendations that ultimately spurred a partnership between the city of Chicago, Chicago Public Schools, um, about 30 community-based organizations, philanthropy, as well as internet service providers to launch Chicago Connected. Uh, which really we really felt was the country's most comprehensive internet connectivity program for students. Since we launched uh, Chicago Connected, we have served um, over 60,000 households, 100,000 students, so nearly one out of three CPS students. Um, we've also been able to over, we, we've halved and actually more than had the digital divide for households with kids in the city of Chicago. We're at a place now where 93%, this is from the most recent uh, census data in 2021, but 93% of all households in the city of Chicago with kids uh, now have high-speed internet at home and an, an internet-enabled device at home. We've also provided adults uh, who enrolled in the program with about 30,000 uh, hours of digital learning support uh, and training as well, in addition to um, having dozens of uh, device distribution events with nonprofit providers here in Chicago as well. Wow, that's phenomenal. Anissa, I'll turn to you now from a corporate perspective on this. Oh, thank you. So. I'm sure many of you heard this in the first panel as well. When we talk about the digital divide, we often hear the interplay between broadband access, adoption, and affordability. And we were laser focused on attempting to address all three um, when the pandemic hit, as my fellow panelists mentioned almost three years ago to the date. And so during the pandemic, we were laser focused on making sure every American was connected to high-speed broadband service so they can participate in work, school, and more. We were one of the first broadband providers to raise our hands and elect to participate in the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, EBB, that is now the Affordable Connectivity Program, ACP. Uh, we committed to spend $2 billion between 2021 and 2023 to help those who need to get connected, get connected. Our access, from AT&T product offers eligible customers with high-speed broadband service for uh, $30 a month. And coupled with the ACP, the now ACP, uh, eligible households can get broadband access for no cost. A few examples of additional programs that we developed to help drive broadband adoption. We uh, stood up uh, additional connected learning centers and this is a collaborative effort with local communities that provides students and families with free access to high-speed fiber internet, Wi-Fi, technology resources, and digital literacy content. We um, currently have hubs that span from Raleigh, North Carolina to Los, Los Angeles and Houston to Chicago, and we have committed to opening more than 50 nationwide. We also created a $10 million distance learning and family connections fund to expand online learning resources and develop new learning resources designed for COVID-19 school closures. We also partnered with the Public Library Association to offer free digital literacy skills and courses and workshops. There are, um, these courses will teach internet basic skills to help encourage broadband adoption. I know that we have a couple of more minutes together during this panel, so I'll reserve uh, more of those examples for our later questions. Thank you, Sarah Kate. Thank you. I think the partnership between civil society and corporate is really critical, especially in those emergency situations. Thomas, do you wanna um, comment on this for OATS as well? Sure, um, and and I think some of our work echoes, you know, some of the thinking that that Norma and Hal and 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 Anise and others are saying. So I'll try to not over, um, not repeat too much. But OITS does technology training for seniors. We've been doing it since 2004, and primarily we've been doing it in senior planet centers in New York City, and then other cities like Denver or upstate New York and Plattsburgh, 
uh, and through partnerships. And when the uh, COVID crisis began, we were already teaching some online courses uh, in a hybrid format. So we had about 100 modules of uh, technology training that were available to be converted online. So we were kind of in a uh, at the starting line with some materials there, but everybody had to learn to teach on Zoom. So we did the the quick you know pivot uh, format change that everybody was going through. And within 60 days, had all, pretty much all of our curriculum online, but we had to reformat everything because our courses go for 10 weeks and nobody's going to take a 10 week class online with the same level of, of scheduling that they'll come to a center. It doesn't work quite like that. So uh, we learned a lot about how to do things differently. Around the same time, the city of New York gave away 10,000 uh, tablets to um, residents of the New York City Housing Authority and they asked if, uh, to older adults and they asked if we would do the training. So we created a call center. Uh, that helped people with the unboxing of the tablets. Uh, we developed an online training course for people where they could uh, take a five week class to learn how to use the tablets. And we organized it with the Android device so people could get the materials. Um, there's actually a, a, a study that we did with a Cornell University researcher showing the results of people uh, taking those courses, what kinds of social engagement outcomes they got. So, so how we also did some studies as well, I got some data there um, and we're able to make that case that investments in digital inclusion programming make a huge difference in people's well-being, their social engagement, um, their uh, loneliness statistics with the UCLA loneliness survey, uh, that, with all sorts of data points there. And then at the same time, we ended up um, sort of creating this corporate affiliation with AARP. And so that was a real game changer for us. We became a, um, a structural corporate relation uh, affiliate with the, with the organization at ARP, which gave us access to all 50 ARP state offices as potential channels and started distributing our programs nationwide through licensing agreements, uh, a couple of additional surveys. And then finally, uh, we had some corporate partnerships and, and have worked with AT&T in the past. We worked with um, Humana Foundation that did a $3 million grant for a project called Aging Connected to help um, support EBB and other kinds of uh, the uh, emergency broadband benefit. We're trying to stay away from acronyms here uh, and, and help people with these really critical subsidy programs um, and supporting the affordable connectivity uh, program as well uh, now. And so we've been working with corporate support to build these relationships out around the country. Uh, T-Mobile recently announced a million dollar grant to Oats to do this work in rural areas. So um, we're trying to bridge those um, resources to make sure we can reach into communities with high quality programming. That's great. You know, Stephen, I'm wondering if you have a view on this, especially coming from the Virgin Islands um, and and what your view, what what worked for you during this? Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, I wish I could be as glowing about it than uh, my peers here. Uh, the Virgin Islands, it was the pits, right? It, it, we didn't have any of this, <laughs> right? Uh, you, mainly because, you know, we're you know 3,000 miles away from everybody. And on top of, you know, not that far, but we're we're uh, we're out in the middle of the Atlantic, so it's very difficult. We don't have as far, we don't have the resources. So one of the the base issues that we had right when the pandemic hit, when the schools went to uh, virtual classes, you know, you'd have, you know, there weren't, we didn't have ready supplies of tablets. We didn't have uh, connectivity to uh, locations and in a lot of locations where you did like in public housing which we have a disproportionate amount of our, our territory in public housing right you'd have one tablet and three or four kids on one tablet so we had tremendous issues with with logistics issues um, not only the timing of getting tablets and, and computers here but also the a lot of the people who were, were working mothers in particular couldn't take time off school to supervise her kids to use the tablets. So it was a debacle here for quite a while. You know, finally we got it together probably uh, after the first 12 months. But the first the first 12 months, we you know, we're still suffering from the digital lag that happened here in the territory. One of the things that our agency did since we're the middle mile provider is that we provided pre free internet and subsidize the internet to all the ISPs. So the only thing we could do was to say, okay, let's let's open it up, make it free, you know, no throttling, all that. So that's the only thing that we really could do, but um, the resources were slow and few to come to the Virgin Islands. Um, so the only thing, the only really thing we could do was uh, provide access. Now going forward for the next pandemic, what we've done is that VINGM is uh, the provider of the outreach program for the affordable uh, connectivity program, 
We're also working with the NTIA on the BEAT and digital equity programs. So all those programs now going forward, we're in a very good position to be able to harness uh, our federal partners to make sure that we're more equipped. But um, when in the but this is in the aftermath, right? So. Right. We'll get to that part. All right. Um, Jinsu, I just didn't want to leave you out, but <laughs> unless you have anything to contribute. We can move on to the next. Sure, I, we can talk a little bit about what our office has done and uh, the perspective that we're trying to provide on this issue. So, you know, a little background. We know that as we continue recovering from the pandemic, educators are increasingly leveraging some of the active and innovative learning approaches that are made possible through technology. We also see schools that are accelerating the implementation of whole learner approaches that are supported by technology as well, right? You can think about social emotional development support, parent educator uh, conferences that aren't limited by physical time and space um, and other types of wraparound support. So, and we have an opportunity as Stephen uh, sort of uh, pointed out under the bipartisan infrastructure law for these types of opportunities to become a lot more equitably and sustainably at scale, especially through the Digital Act, Equity Act programs that NTIA is running. Um, so when the uh, bill was first passed, you know, our office, knowing that we're not the lead agency on all those digital equity efforts, you know, asked ourselves a series of questions, um, you know, thinking about what the Department of Education's role can be in helping maximize the impact of that $65 billion broadband package, especially as state leaders and develop plans for spending those dollars and in carrying out this role, how we can help increased access for learners and their families who are furthest from digital opportunities. So we launched a uh, digital equity initiative known as our Digital Equity Education Roundtables Initiative or the DEER Initiative, um, where we held a series of national conversations, listening sessions with communities and organizations, um, learners, families um, that are championing education and digital access, where we had a chance to talk about three major things, some of the most pressing barriers that learner communities face, promising strategies to overcome those barriers and notable examples of those strategies um, that are in practice right now. And we use all of those uh, conversations, the data that we get they're gathered to develop guidance for leaders as they begin developing those state plans, state digital equity plans. And we were able to launch this resource uh, back in September of last year at our National Digital Equity Summit. And you can find that resource on tech.ed.gov slash D-E-E-R. And more, most specifically to this conversation, um, um, topic of this panel, we intentionally in our guidance give the most attention to that issue of adoption because the education sector knows you know, well that it's not enough to make technology available and affordable, although those are really critical pieces, we also need to pay, uh, take a human approach to the issue, right? As our other panelists talked about, meeting communities where they are, helping them use technology uh, in ways that supports their individual goals and needs. So in later questions, I can talk about uh, some of the other things that we're doing, but that's something that uh, we are bringing to the table on, on this digital equity and adoption conversation. That's great. Um, Norma, I will start this another question, which is what worked well in reaching the diversity of the communities you serve? And I guess also what didn't go well? Um, so we can learn from that as well, because this is all about sharing information and learning. Sure, I'll start off with the positive, what what worked well. Um, certainly in, in the work that we do, again, driving broadband adoption, getting devices out to folks and providing digital skills training, um, we needed to ensure that we were working with organizations that were embedded in the various communities that we work with, and specifically organizations that had built trust, in particular nonprofits, public housing agencies as well, community health um, clinics really organize themselves to meet the needs beyond what their regular services offered, right? We saw organizations doing food drives. We saw organizations um, donating devices. We saw them do a number of things that were really critical to the communities that they serve, which were all the, also the same communities that were disproportionately affected by the pandemic, as well as the digital divide. And so for us, it was really important to engage those organizations and really, most importantly, um, work with them to identify what were the best outreach strategies? What were the best ways to get connected 
with their the community members that they serve? How do we customize our digital skills curriculum to ensure that we're meeting the needs of the participants that we're aiming to train? That was really critical. Um, I'll mention really briefly that we actually conducted a national research um, project during the pandemic. It was funded by Microsoft and the Bomber Group to look at the digital divide in the midst of the pandemic. And one thing that really stood out, I think we already knew, but it was important to still get it out there, is that of the, the survey participants, 65% said that um, they trusted library, a combination of libraries, schools, and nonprofits to learn about resources. Um, and we asked specifically at that time about the emergency broadband benefit. And again, up, upwards of 60% said they were learning about those kind of programs through these combination of organizations. So we can't underestimate how important it is to work with trusted um, organizations in, in various communities. That's great. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Hal, how did how did you reach, you know, how did, how did reaching diverse audiences and communities um, how did you get that done during this pandemic? Well, it's, it's a great segue from what Norma was just talking about. Um, so I would say, you know, in Chicago, Net, it's, it's a very special, unique partnership between government, the community organizations, internet service providers, philanthropy, again, a four year, $50 million program, but really specifically our community based organizations. Um, and so to Norma's point, I mean, kind of the, the community anchor institutions, these were organizations that in some cases had done nothing on digital divide prior to the pandemic. Um, but really, you know, they were doing contact tracing, uh, they were they were doing food drives, they were doing other support services uh, in those communities. Um, very trusted partners uh, with, with participants, participants in those communities, um, and, and they were invaluable. Um, so on the outreach side, in terms of getting families signed up for Chicago Connected, they helped uh, bridge trust gaps. Um, we had issues right from the very beginning, you asked about what didn't work. Uh, one of the things was when we were doing sort of mass marketing, uh, talking about free internet, you know, sending text messages to families, you know, click here to, for free internet, nobody wanted to click on that, right? I think it, we're all taught, uh, you know, nothing in life is free. So having community partners follow up, uh, and we changed our marketing, our messaging, and said, you know, this is actually no cost to you. That was a big uh, shift, and we saw numbers skyrocket after that. Mm -hmm. But our community organizations, being able to call and answer uh, families' questions, any concerns that they had, was truly uh, and very, very impactful. Also, just being able to reach families in non-traditional ways, so not just calling and texting, um, but actually going to, uh, you know, being at, you know, a food drive or other uh, community events, even during the pandemic, was also um, uh, super helpful, um, in addition just to being ambassadors for the program. I would say on the digital learning side, um, our community partners um, have designed kind of their own community-specific uh, digital learning programs. And so we offer, through the program, um, opportunities to be able to use content from Northstar, from Coursera, to kind of meet learners' needs. But we've also allowed our community organization to be very entrepreneurial and innovative when it comes to designing their own programs. So, for example, we have the YMCA Metro Chicago here that, that has a bilingual help desk uh, for, uh, for tech questions, right? Um, more basic foundational information. How do I turn on my computer? How do I set up an email account? Um, but then being able to pair um, those types of opportunities with higher level certification uh, programs as well. We've got a community organization here, Northwest Center, that's been doing work um, in a cohort model, where essentially they're working with groups of 10 to 12 parents. They go through a, you know, a 10 week rigorous course, they complete, they graduate, um, actually get certifications. There's a whole graduation ceremony for, for the families um, that are part of the program. And then some of those families actually go and teach the next cohort. So it becomes almost like a workforce development opportunity as well. Uh, and then with the digital, uh, with, with actually getting devices out to families, um, our partners here on the ground, CompuDA, PCs for People, which I know have uh, national reach as well, they were able to partner with community-based organizations to design kind of lottery uh, opportunities for families, in some cases, just having enough devices for whoever signed up and being able to partner on device distribution events. But the trust, the trust for community organizations was um, just, just an incredible benefit of the program. We would not have been successful uh, without it. That's, that's, you know, partnership and trust I'm hearing quite a bit of. Um, Thomas, I'm sure that was a lot of your experience as well. But in terms of getting to these diverse communities, like even within the older community, you're talking about black and brown folks, you're talking about LGBTQ folks. Do you, how do you get to those who are marginalized even within um, a segment of the community? Uh, you know, we did a couple of things that, that seemed to work. First of all, in our online programs, we made them almost friction free for people to sign up by not requiring uh, pre-registration for most of our classes. So um, we felt we experimented a bit with this, but found that 
when we created uh, high quality programming that was really easy for people to access with a single click, we had larger numbers and we were able to reach, last year we did 380,000 engagements with our courses. And, mm -hmm. um, but in order to reach more people that were um, in different uh, demographies, we, we went, uh, we translated all of our materials uh, into Spanish and a large number of them into Chinese. So um, in all of the course uh, materials now, 35% of the OATS uh, classroom materials are now in uh, another language. Uh, we have, uh, we delivered the first 10 week um, training program in Montgomery County uh, last year in Chinese that we've ever done. And then that went online has been used in uh, other sites around the country. Um, and then we worked with localities that have um, particular um, communities that they're serving. So we got uh, Bear County committed to use some of their um, funds to promote uh, broadband access and a technology uh, distribution program that we supported there. Uh, we're working with Santa Clara County in, in California um, and we're reaching into Miami. Now we're going to be opening a center there later this year, uh, serving people in uh, Miami with technology programs as well. So we're uh, we're actually uh, leveraging ARP quite a bit to um, target certain communities that we can reach. Uh, we, we called up ARP's research team and said, uh, we'd like to figure out the most effective places that we can make a difference. And we calculated um, two different variables. One is how many uh, older people have broadband access at home, what percentage? Mm -hmm. And then we calculated 18 to 64, the younger population, and we subtracted the larger number from the, the small one. So we got the gap between young and old around technology. And then we organized it, but we mapped it across the country and picked uh, localities where the gap was the largest. And those are places where our work is most powerfully needed. Uh, and we've been able to identify those communities and start investing more in those areas with our licensing initiatives to make sure that we're reaching people that otherwise wouldn't be able to get online. Well, oh, one more thing, us, rural, oh, yeah. lots of work on rural. Uh, rural gonna, communities are yeah. often left out and it's, it's a kind of critical area around this work. Um, they have special considerations in terms of the access in terms of how the organ the companies and the competition um, it lays out for the consumers there. Um, it really requires a different set of approaches and the content and the um, institutional supports are different. So we've been working in upstate New York, but also rural Colorado and Texas and other areas to have special programming for rural communities. Um, we did a project with um, supported by Schmidt Futures with the uh, New York Library Association across the north, the northern uh, counties that uh, border with Canada. And there's been a real effort to bring rural people online. And I know a lot of other people on this call have been working with those rural communities, but I really want to make sure we're emphasizing the needs of those those individuals and citizens out there. It's really making a big difference. And was that where you saw the biggest gap? If you had to lay it out, what were the... the the biggest gaps were interestingly um, in a lot of them were in urban areas for the gaps because what you found in the gaps was that they had a lot of connectivity. So the people that were the younger population was online mostly for work and social purposes. And then they would also in, in many of the cities, they tend to have a lower income population of older adults who had trouble uh, with the affording the Internet before the affordable connectivity program existed. So the historical trend has been that in many communities, you've got that older adult population that the access is there. Uh, but the money wasn't necessarily there and they didn't always have the resources in terms of free quality training. I mean, um, I know that, you know, um, uh, that Norm has been doing all this work and getting people online in different places and, and, and how in Chicago and elsewhere. But there just aren't enough training programs on the ground. There hasn't been enough resources to help people uh, in rural areas, in the in, in, in urban areas, in rural areas a lot more younger people are offline as well. So the gap isn't quite as big. The connectivity rates are lower and people are struggling. Uh, in many rural um, households don't have high speed internet right to their home yet, or it's prohibitively expensive to make that connection uh, or support the network over time. Even things like tax patterns in certain states make it uh, difficult for folks. So uh, we really have to solve that program in, in different ways in different geographies. Thank you for that, Thomas. Does anybody want to, else want to contribute to that before we move on to the next question? I would. Sorry, Great. go ahead. Um, the one of the things that, uh, you know, I sound like a Debbie Downer here, but uh, one of the things that happened in the Virgin Islands, you know, the Virgin Islands is a rural community uh, and a disadvantaged community on top of that. But one of the things that was really unique to the Virgin Islands and the, the mainland is that the pandemic happened just a, a few years after Hurricane Irma and Maria. And so when Irma and Maria came through, it wiped, Irma and Maria wiped out all of our um, 
community access um, institutions. So the libraries, which would normally be a place for uh, distance learning and, and telemedicine and all that, all of our libraries were, were destroyed and we're still building them back. You know, the churches and the community centers and nonprofits that would also be agencies to help the community were all destroyed and still being rebuilt. So what happened was that the, the nonprofit organizations and, and, and government agencies that would normally come to help in, for the pandemic weren't, weren't um, able to do so. So then it was the private sector and the, private, the, the profit motive of the private sector, they fought with each other and then they fought with, with the public sector. So it took us a year to be able to get a coordinated effort on how to address distant learning in particular in the territory because we're still reeling from the hurricanes of, of 2017 and we're still in the aftermath of that. So one of the things that VINGN was thrust into was trying to be a mediator and trying to uh, elevate our, 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 our stature because we're a semi-autonomous uh, government agency. Um, but we're also interfaced with the pr private sector. So here in the Virgin Islands, you know, it, it, we're also left out, you know, Guam, American Samoa, the territories are all left out. So the Microsoft uh, uh, study is a fantastic study, but they missed the Virgin Islands. They missed Guam. They missed American Samoa. Right. So a lot of the national resources and data that's available, none of that data has the territories inclusive in them. So we're still an I we're still islands even in the nat national conversation because we don't exist mainly because of our size, mainly because of our uh, or also because of our geography. Um, so that would be nice to be able to be included in some of these national studies. Lastly, I would say that the number one partner that we have going forward, which is uh, more positive here, is ARP. ARP has a disproportionate uh, influence in the Virgin Islands. So we use them heavily on trying to craft our digital equity programs going forward in our ACP outreach program. So we're relying on uh, ARP because they not, not only do they deal with the elderly population, but they've also been very instrumental in dealing with the uh, low income population here as well. So from a covered population, they're our, 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 our top go to partner. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Norma. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to add that with the theme around um, reaching diverse communities, I think two things stood out for us as well. One was that it was important as we implemented our capacity building trainings or our train the trainer trainings that we were training folks from the communities that we were serving. So one example is that with the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles or HACLA, we implemented a train the trainer specifically around the emergency broadband benefit and now ACP and just broadly digital inclusion resources and we were targeting um, community health workers so HACLA was already training fellow residents to get the word out on vaccine information other critical services so we were able to plug into that existing training and talk about ACP as an example and so these were folks that were living in their communities knew their neighbors and the surrounding community and that was just a great way to in, in you know in our effort to reach broadly larger number of people but also you know folks that represented um, the the community so that's one thing making sure that we're training folks from the community to also help get the word out. The other is that in our delivery of our digital skills trainings, we were very intentional about um, recruiting uh, people from diverse backgrounds. And because we deliver um, our trainings in a virtual slash format, hybrid format, we're able to attract people from across the country. And these are folks that are professionals in their own right. They're graduate students. We had a couple of um, uh, professors that signed up to be our instructors, which was really cool. And other folks that were just looking to have um, some so, some sort of social impact in 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 the in the country, and so um, again we were intentional about recruiting folks that have diverse backgrounds, lived experiences, you know, that in some way may reflect the populations that we serve. And it was really neat to hear from our digital skills participants that they loved meeting people from across the country. So we had folks in LA that were being trained by folks in New York, 
in Florida. And, you know, thanks to technology, they were able to to make that connection virtually and learn from each other. So definitely two things I think are, are very important to consider in when, we, when it comes to engaging diverse communities. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's move on to our third question, which is what strategies worked well that you would share with other leaders? So what what went well for you that you would share with um, your peers? And I'll start with um, Stephen on that one. What worked well for, oh good, you just start uh, optimistically, right? Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> making my... you be optimistic today. You know? <laughs> Turning my, my curmudgeon around. Um, what, what, what worked well for us eventually was uh, something that our governor did, um, and that was, uh, he came on the radio, and uh, when I spoke about the, the hurricanes, he, he spoke about the pandemic as being another hurricane. You know, he rallied the community around um, being self-sufficient. You know, Puerto Rico wasn't gonna come to our aid. The mainland wasn't gonna come to our aid. So we had to um, rely on ourselves. And what happened with that is it pertains to broadband is that you got more people sharing of resources that they did have, which is exactly what we do here under a severe hurricane situation. So even though we didn't have a lot of resources, there was a lot of sharing of uh, infrastructure that people had, whether it be connectivity, whether it be a device uh, or, or know-how. So that was one of the things that worked really well is that the community itself did exactly, it, 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 it hunkered down uh, for the pandemic and, and shared resources. That was, and that was the, the leadership of our governor. And, and that is something that worked really well here. That's great, leadership. Um, Hal? You had some things to share with us that worked well as well. Yeah, I would say um, first and foremost, I think as you're designing programs, it's critical to actually involve the users in that design. So I think whether we had community partners, but also families that are in the program, we did uh, digital learning, for example. You know, when we when we launched the connectivity portion, we had to move quickly. It was a crisis. It was an emergency. We had to get inter folks signed up for the internet as soon as possible, or else kids could not learn um, during the pandemic. When it came to digital learning, however, you know, we knew a ton of information about CPS, couple of school students. We knew nothing about their families. We knew nothing about the adults in the household. We knew nothing about their learning interests, um, their their employment rates, um, what types of content they wanted to study, what types of information, how did they actually want to uh, consume that information, whether it be, you know, remote, whether it be classes, whether it be, you know, participating with, uh, with, with other individuals. And so we had to really design it in partnership with our stakeholders. And so we did a series of surveys. We've done a surveys every single year in the program. Um, we work really hard to get good response rates. Uh, we, we've gotten over 5,000 responses out of you know, 60,000 households every single year that we've done the survey. But we've kind of designed the programs based on um, what, what people ask for, right? And offering that kind of spectrum of opportunities. Um, and that's why I think we've seen so much usage and so much uh, positive um, uh, reactions from our families about the program itself. I would also say you know, surveys and other ways of kind of collecting data that kind of the spirit of continuous improvement um, are really essential to um, being able to identify where there are challenges in the program. For example, when we first uh, launched the program, we were able to see from folks taking the survey in Spanish um, that they had longer wait times um, than other. That was one of their biggest complaints was longer wait times to sign up. And so we were able to go to our internet service providers and say, hey, here's what the data is saying. You're doing fine with English speaking folks. Um, that's not a big complaint, but with our Spanish speaking uh, families, that's a concern. So they were able to add uh, extra Spanish speaking customer service representatives in the call centers to be able to help those families get signed up. So I think a spirit of continuous improvement um, is really essential to ensure that the program not only meets its intended uh, in the intended uses, but also that you're you're continuing to collect information to make sure uh, that there, if there are opportunities for improvement that you can make those along the way. That's great. I love that spirit of continuous improvement. Um, Thomas, do you want to chime in on what you would um, share as well with other leaders that went well? Yeah, I think what went well for us was was really partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. That's the thing that we learned about, and I hate to beat that drum a little bit, but everybody uses the word, but then they don't dig into what it really means. And we'd always been working doing programs at different people's uh, community centers and, and, and helping. But what we found was that um, with the, the growing need that was out there, we knew that we had a process um, kind of similar to, to, I think, to, to a lot of people on the panel, especially I know Norma's work, um, what we do works. 
and we know it works. But what we don't know is how to get to from a thousand people to ten thousand or a hundred thousand. And in order to do that, you have to le leverage larger scale institutions. Um, you know, we've got the materials, we've got the expertise, but how do I hire? Uh, how do I can't hire 500 trainers overnight? I just we don't have the capacity to do that. So we created a program called Senior Planet Licensing, which was original, originally supposed to just be in rural areas where we knew we couldn't get the infrastructure built um, for our own programs, but it was already out there, mostly in libraries, but also in a lot of community centers, service organizations, um, area agencies on aging, um, uh, multi-generation uh, 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 multi organizations that were doing the work. And uh, we created a model where uh, organizations could apply to OATS to become licensing partners, go through a course where we would train them how to deliver our curriculum and about all the methodological stuff that we use and also how to gather the outcome data. We don't care about the individual personal data, but we care a lot about the impact that you're having in the community using these resources. So we made our curriculum available to the licensing partners that went through that training, as long as they would agree to share back the aggregate data with us and we could make a case that we're making a difference. Um, when that program launched, we thought we might get to, you know, 50 programs around the country within a year or two. We're over 200 now and counting this year. We're expecting to hit 300. And so we found that partners out there are really excited to work with these materials. Um, and I, you know, I was on the call with CARICOM actually with the, uh, in, the in the Caribbean recently, Stephen, and, and um, there's, there's a lot of interest in other countries to use a lot of these materials as well. And then the last thing is, up the food chain from us, there are bigger organizations that provide capacity, like AARP, who's kind of a parent nonprofit for us now, but also funding partners with corporations, particularly and, and philanthropic foundations. AT&T has been super active. A lot of the telecommunications com companies and healthcare uh, insurers came out of the woodwork when COVID started and said, we want to help immediately. We have emergency grants available. We have channels to distribute your programs. We can help you get into communities, make relations, you know, build relationships with public agencies. And we relied on that stuff to get all the funding that we needed to get moving with this work. So those public private nonprofit partnerships were driving the, the the resources that we needed and the community partners were delivering all this work with their expertise around the country in those neighborhoods and towns and rural areas that, that we couldn't otherwise have worked in. That's great. Um, if nobody has any more to add to this, I'll move on to the next question, which is a bit up, oh, Stephen and, and, and G. So we'll go to Stephen and then we'll go to G. Yeah, I actually have a, a question um, for you, Thomas, um, when you mentioned CARICOM, because you, you actually brought up, a, 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 I'm really happy to hear that. I can definitely say that we would be interested in, you know, we can't help you scale up, but we can help you scale down, right? You know, we're 87,000 people here, but that's still a scaling issue, right? Scaling down is just as difficult sometimes as scaling up. Um, but one of the things that w w could be interesting in the Virgin Islands is that we could help with you know, the overall CARICOM, right? You know, as far as when you aggregate all CARICOM together, then we make us we make the size of Maine <laughs> as a state. But the international issues that we have in the Caribbean uh, affect us here as a U.S. territory. So um, it would be very interesting to learn more about that program because I think one of the things that is is interesting about best practices for uh, digital inclusion is that it goes beyond our borders, right? And, uh, the, and and outside of our borders affects us, right? You know, the border states with Mexico is the same thing as the border islands to the Virgin Islands, right? Those issues impact all of us. So we can figure out how to regionalize some of these programs, I think would help us domestically as well. Absolutely. Um, Jisoo? Yeah, I don't mean to uh, beat a dead horse, but I just want to circle back to what Norma and Hal mentioned at the top of question number two around um, needing to leverage trusted partners, right? I come from an immigrant background and growing up, you know, we had to rely on those trusted community organizations for information about different programs just to make sure it wasn't a scam, right? Just, you know, programs designed to collect information uh, from my family. So, you know, 
reflecting on that experience, I really want to sort of double down on that as a strategy, you know, leveraging those trusted bodies. And, you know, coming from the Department of Education, we know that our schools, our institutions of higher education, community colleges, those, you know, agencies and organizations can serve as those trusted hubs of information in many communities. So that's why, you know, uh, for us, we designed a uh, page uh, with resources and FAQs about the affordable connectivity program designed for those school leaders, designed for districts, designed for um, community colleges. Um, and we also um, co collaborated with organizations that convene some of the key stakeholders uh, within the education sector that are trusted. For example, most recently we worked with NAESP and NASSP, uh, which are the National Association of Educate, um, Elementary um, school principals and the National Association of Secondary School Principals um, to let them know how principals can play a critical role in spreading information about um, the affordable connectivity program because uh, schools are often, you know, go to resources for a lot of families when it comes to this type of uh, programmatic information, right? We also, you know, shared information about the ACP with um, higher education institutional leaders so that students who qualify uh, under the Pell Grant, you know, were able to access that information and make sure that the information was accurate coming from a trusted resource. And then, you know, collaborating with trusted parents uh, parent-facing organizations like Learning Heroes and PTA to make sure that their stakeholders could access information about the affordable connectivity program, the benefits it provides for them, the relevance to them as well. So just wanted to, you know, um, double down on that strategy of, you know, identifying those community-based assets, leveraging those trusted bodies to uh, as distributors of information and technical assistance. That's great. Anissa? Yeah, and I think my fellow panelists said most of what I was going to say, those trusted partnerships are key and critical and we bolstered them and we definitely relied on them heavily to reach the communities that we serve. And I think I, what I'm also hearing and that we also implemented during COVID was a very creative and kind of open-minded approach to get to these solutions because we recognized very, very quickly that there was one, no, one, there was no, one size fits all solution to driving adoption. Um, Steven. Yes. Your hand is up. Or oh, that was my a, accident. I guess I didn't lower. <laughs> um, I thought you had something more optimistic to say. Oh yeah, more optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you have that Caribbean Optim sun. Uh, the optimism is look out your window. And then see if you want to take a trip to the Virgin Islands. That's the optimism. <laughs> I, I say yes. I'm raising my hand for that. Um, I think that's really key. Government, civil society, and corporate partnerships are critical, not only in crisis situations, but even actually we wouldn't get to a crisis potentially if there was partnership there. Um, but those are definitely best practices. Um, all right. So now... Keeping that in mind, let's say um, sky's the limit within reason. What do you need from the federal government, the private sector, or community organizations, depending on where you sit, to advance the work that you are doing? So how do we build on this partnership? How do we scale, like you were saying, Thomas, and get to not only scale, but get to really hard to get to places, a la the Virgin Islands or rural America? And let's go to, um, I'll start with Stephen on this one, if you don't mind. Thank you. Actually, uh, I appreciate that. I think the the ACP program is probably one of the, the best programs that, that I've seen, you know, that would help us. Um, however, one of the challenges we have with ACP programs, is the enrollment process itself is very difficult. Mm. Um, and we're finding the, the difficulties is on two fronts. One is that there's a we found that a lot of people don't want to um, participate in ACP programs because they don't want to give up the personal data that's required for it. And they feel like the government's being intrusive just to be able to get this voucher. That's the first challenge that we have. And then the second challenge, and this is one of the things we're trying to work through with ARP, is that the, the application process itself is cumbersome. So if it could be, and then people are wondering, it's like, is this only for one year? Is it for two years? How long is this program? 
because the the what we're finding here is that the ISPs don't like it because we're only eighty seven thousand people, so there's not that much to defray the cost for the ISPs to offer the program. So they're like, yeah, we offer it, but we're not talking about it um, because they can't upsell off the program. So if there's more that the federal government can do to help make the, the to lower the barriers of entry for the ACP program, that would be a godsend for us in the territory. Sounds like more transparency and um, less um, information sharing um, would be helpful or, you know, intrusiveness into personal information. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the if there's one thing that's that I'm hearing constantly about that program, it's that they're like, I don't want to tell the Fed. They know too much about me already. I don't want to. I just want the the internet. And and people, it's interesting that they'll say, I'd rather forgo the internet than give up personal data. Um, it's amazing. And I hear that a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Hal, what what would help you? So I think uh, a couple of things. One is that, um, and I think Stephen made some incredible points there just about the barriers for ACP. We, with Chicago Connected, we really, we made it just name and address pretty much because, you know, there's a couple of schools that essentially pre-qualified every single family. They got an activation code, so they just called, gave the code. We kind of skipped that verification process. Um, mm. CPS handled that directly, and they've already got families that have that information. So I think that's a great idea. I would say for us, you know, Chicago Connected was a foundation. The city of Chicago is now built off of two um, first go kind of a community listening process, but to ultimately develop a digital equity plan. And so the city is putting about $28 million towards that effort. But I think the federal government, um, both directly and also through, obviously through the contributions um, to state government, um, those funding commitments are really important. Um, the timelines that have been shared um, have been really important. And so organizations um, that need those funds to sustain these efforts, right? We've got community organizations who have now added digital equity to some of the core work that they're doing now. They, they've seen the benefit of how having a connected um, households benefits the ability for them to deliver other, other services households, more efficient services. They don't have to come and take two buses or a train to come down to a physical location to get help with immigration services, um, you know, help with housing assistance, et cetera. They can actually reach those families remotely. They can serve more families that way. And so I think my worry is that if there are delays or we have issues with appropriations to get that money out to localities uh, and to state governments, that community organizations who rely, you know, they don't get a lot of general operating dollars um, typically. Um, so that, you know, they have to, they kind of work grant to grant in many respects. And so if we lose the staff because there's a fund, there's a gap in funding essentially that the city can't make up for, um, then we lose kind of the boots on the ground. The people that have been trained for the last three years to do this programming, and then we might lose momentum uh, across the city in terms of being able to do digital divide uh, issues as well. I would also just acknowledge that our private sector partners, I think specifically our internet service providers, they could also help bridge that gap by committing resources um, to organizations to help, whether it's outreach, whether it's um, whether it's ACP outreach, whether it's also um, providing uh, support so folks can actually hire and have staff to do digital learning trainings, um, and then of course devices as well. If there's a way to um, also retire um, old devices that that those uh, ISPs and I would say the broader business community has access to work with local refurbishment partners get those out to communalization to get them out to the community um, that those are also roles that they can play um, as well. That's great. I love that. Thank you, Thomas. Excuse me. Um, well, first and foremost, make sure that older adults are included. It's just such an important, I mean, I have to advocate for the group that we work with, but it's it's really important not just to uh, make sure that older people get uh, supported with these programs, but make sure you cast a wide net. You know, no group or no demographic that's having a hard time with technology should be left out of these initiatives. They need to be comprehensive. They need to be inclusive. And it's really important to make sure you cover all those bases. There have been programs in the past that didn't reach everybody. And we want to make sure that that is something that we don't, you know, we don't repeat. And then secondly, um, I think there's a real need to invest in partnerships out here uh, and, and invest in the capacity on the large scale of organizations that can do this work at scale. You know, the everyone ons, um, the the in 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 older adults uh, services. There's uh, networks of housing organizations like National Church Residences that are out there that cover multiple states. There are uh, AAA associate organizations that work with uh, large numbers of local agencies in Philadelphia and elsewhere. So investing in the larger organizations that have capacity to reach tens of thousands of people will help us with that scale. 
But at the same time, there's two other things that we need to consider. One is how do we activate innovation at the grassroots level? Um, we work with groups all around the country. We survey them around what they need. And what we're finding is there are a lot of s locations around the country that have great ideas and great programming, but you know what they don't have? They don't have a laptop cart. You know, for like $5,000, this organization could be just knocking them out of the park every day, but they don't have that investment at the grassroots level to activate the already exciting opportunities they've got. They know their constituencies, they know the programs, but they don't have the investment. And so we have to make sure that there's large scale investment in, in, in agencies that can reach large numbers of folks, but also ways to reach those people in the communities and make that happen. And the last thing is, we need sustainability over time with these programs. Um, I remember, because I worked many, many years ago on the top program from the Department of Commerce in the, around 1994 or something like that. Some of you may recall that on this call. Then I worked on BTOP. They added the B, so it became broadband technology opportunities after uh, they had started with technology opportunities. That was another huge opportunity for us. That was like 15 years later and 10 years in the past now. And now we have another federal infusion. But every single state, every single community and the federal government needs to be asking, how do we make sure that these programs are designed so that they sustain into the future and don't end or go off a cliff in two or three years after we've built all these resources and all this momentum, how do we make sure that this stuff works? And, and you know, that goes to the private sector as well. I've talked to some of the telecoms companies. They say, we're building networks, but the networks cost money to, to manage, to maintain. How do we make sure those funding resources uh, through the market or through government or some hybrid are able to keep us going into the future? I'm not sure I've heard that plan yet. That's great. Well, that leads me over to Anissa, because I think from your perspective, it would be really interesting to hear what can the government help you with from the court. You're the only corporate perspective on this panel um, or the community organization, civil society. What is it um, when you're doing this work, when you're putting these programs together, that would be really helpful to build them to be better, stronger and sustainable? And then I'll come to you, Norma. Yeah, thank you for that. So I guess it's interesting because, you know, we are regulated by the FCC to <laughs> offer services. So there, um, I don't, it, of course, ACP is extremely important. We would love to see the program continue uh, beyond the forecasted end of program that many of us have been hearing rumors around. And so we think that it is a critical piece of the digital divide pie. Um, we also are participating actively in um, advocacy around the BEAD program and the digital equity plans that NTIA is standing up. So oh, I'm sorry, state programs that NTIA has funding to uh, provide to those states. And so we're we're watching that. We're we are hopeful that there's going to be some collaboration um, and a, com a comprehensive state broadband adoption plan um, that could dramatically increase the number of households participating in the uh, opportunities that are available with broadband connectivity. And we do think that there are some best practices that would be helpful um, in that engagement and collaboration, especially around uh, public and nonprofit and private sector company and organizations, um, so that we're incorporating different skill sets and experiences um, into solutioning. And as I mentioned, there's no one size fits all uh, solution to this. So we think that a more collaborative approach um, will be successful. Um, I think, you know, it's going to show up in the results. We have done quite a bit over the last three years to try to, again, meet um, the communities that we serve and meet their needs. And I think going forward, it's going to be extremely pivotal to ensure that we are continuing to engage and collaborate with those that may have their ear to the ground a little more closer than us. And, um, of course, ensure that the federal um, entities that can contribute and support funding do so in a in a way that makes the most sense. Thank you. Norma? Thank you. I, I want to definitely uh, uh, thumbs up, two thumbs up to Hal and Thomas who, regarding raising the, um, you know, making sure organizations have sufficient funding over time to support programs. And I think it also begs the, the 
um, consideration, how, how do we define scale? Right. I know we we think of scale in terms of thousands of people, and certainly this is an urgent issue. We want to make sure folks are connected. They have the skill set so they could start really harnessing the power of the Internet today. That being said, you know, when we think about meaningful adoption, broadband adoption, it's really important to think about what that means. Right. It takes time and it takes people um, to really ensure we're getting the word out people getting devices and training. So meaningful adoption takes sufficient funding, right, to ensure that folks are getting the tools that they need. So I just want us to, to think about that too. And that's across the board, right? We hear it from government, from the philanthropic sector, from private sector, nonprofit sector too. We wanna to reach thousands of people. That's our, our global goal, absolutely. But let's really think about what that is in a meaningful way, in a way that has significant impact in communities. Thank you for that. That's a great way to finish up that question. We're on, we have 10 minutes, well, 12 minutes left. We're on our last question, which is a pretty rich question. Um, and I think everybody's going to have some thoughts on this. So um, we'll just start. Um, I'll actually start with um, Jisoo on this one, but I'll read the question first. Um, looking back to inform how we might look forward, what opportunities exist? to address these adoption and digital readiness challenges at scale, like we're saying, what is scale? Um, for example, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act implemented the Digital Equity Act, providing for the first time federal subsidies specifically targeted at providing funding for digital skilling and readiness program. Do you believe that funding for digital skilling is relevant? And if so, how do you maximize allocation of funding for what is arguably a small fraction of existing federal dollars in this space? So that was a lot of question. Um, I'll come to you first, Jisoo, and I can repeat parts of this too, as um, just give me a nod and I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I'll try to answer um, the full question in part so that uh, my response is clear. And knowing that this is the last question um, in the lineup, you know, first, uh, thank you to all the other panelists. Like I learned so much from all the programs that you all are um, implementing about the strategies that they work, uh, the settings that they work in um, and what work will take for us to really, you know, continue our acceleration towards digital equity. Um, so. Going back to Sarah Kate's question, you know, I really agree that we have an opportunity through the bipartisan infrastructure law to address uh, those adoption challenges at scale, including, as you mentioned, by tackling the issue of digital literacy. And that's not just coming from me. Um, you'll find in our digital equity resource that, you know, our roundtable participants found sustainable investments in digital literacy and resilience uh, to be uh, critical for a lot of different communities. It's not enough that we distribute the necessary physical tools. We also have to offer opportunities for learners and their families um, to develop those digital skills to leverage technology in meeting their um, everyday goals. Um, but our roundtable participants also emphasize some of the other strategies that need to be considered in parallel to maximize the impact of those digital literacy investments, you know, providing those multilingual and multimodal technical supports as well, um, perhaps to through the recruitment of digital navigators from the community. Um, again, leveraging trusted uh, community assets such as our education institutions who have facilitated information exchange and resource distribution throughout the pandemic. And that also means that the staff and faculty in those institutions need adequate training and professional development on how to deliver um, effective digital skills development opportunities. And then also co-creating solutions and regular learning and feedback cycles, right? As adoption strategies that we all discussed or implemented, it's important to ensure that learners and other um, community members have the opportunity to provide open feedback on what's working and requires scaling and what's not working and requires adjustments. And here I actually want to you know, shout out two um, examples directly from our digital equity guidance resource. Uh, Roselle Public Schools in New Jersey, they paid really deliberate attention to the training and the professional development that educators need to leverage the newly invested technology in support of learning. And I'm gonna butcher this name a little bit, but Quinn Sigamon Community College in Massachusetts um, they've been able to connect students to advisors who are helping them build digital literacy skills that are critical to uh, course success. 
And we're currently continuing to develop these additional stories of impact to further illustrate the practices that we're calling for. And you all can find that on tech.ed.gov slash stories. We'll continue to post throughout 2023. And then to your other question about, you know, maximizing the impact of the current funding opportunities, um, OET has been encouraging the education sector and the broadband sector to collaborate with one another as the digital equity planning uh, processes are underway at the state level, you know, given their experiences in navigating the pandemic, developing those trusted relationships in communities and building digital skills on an everyday basis. We really think that the education sector has a lot to offer because they've been champions of digital equity for a long time. So education leaders can serve as that critical asset in the ongoing planning efforts, helping ensure that the learners furthest from opportunity can benefit from investments. Um, and several states have um, also begun announcing opportunities where local level education leaders can contribute to the planning efforts. So we're trying to support those states by getting the word out about those public sessions, town hall meetings, uh, community engagement opportunities uh, with the national organizations that have members and affiliates in those uh, states. And then one last thing, uh, we can also think about braiding different types of programs that have shared objectives. Um, the Office of Ed Tech, we recently revised our office's official Dear Cog letter with the goal to accomplish two things. First, provide information on some of the core consideration areas when we're trying to maximize the ROI on educational technology and clarify which sources of funds um, that are overseen by the Department of Education, like from the Every Student Succeeds Act and IDEA, can support um, each eligible use, including um, digital equity and inclusion. So how can this Dear Cog letter serve as a tool in helping identify those shared goals between the education sector and the broadband sector so that funds and resources can be braided towards these sustainable solutions? And so we hope that uh, this can uh, this can serve as another tool um, in uh, promoting collaboration that leads to the strategic use of funds and maximizing our collective impact. Thank you. Wow. OK, great. That's great. Um, Norma. So two questions, scaling opportunities. What are the scaling which you kind of touched on already, I think? And then how do we maximize the impact of this funding? Yeah, I think we can't overemphasize the importance of strategic partnerships. Um, Thomas mentioned this earlier, um, really looking at how various communities are coming to, together to maximize the funding. So I think it's imperative to have government at the table, philanthropy at the table, private sector, including ISPs at the table, as well as community-based organizations. You know, you look at different models across the country and those that are, are effective so far have brought together those various groups and are creating digital equity plans, are making sure that the the voices of diverse communities are being included, are putting plans together to secure funding. So I think that's imperative, imperative for purposes of having impact and also being able to scale. When it comes to scaling too, can't overemphasize as well the train the trainer model. Again, looking at universities in particular. In fact, we did a project with the University of Memphis, their School of Social Work. We trained their social work students on ACP and other digital literacy resources. And then they went out as part of their capstone project into the community to talk about what's available for folks. So, you know, looking at those kind of model, models that are certainly uh, uh, successful to replicate across the country. That's great. How? Um, I would say a couple of things. I mean, one is that I would say um, federal funding cannot get this alone, get, get this done alone. Um, so I would encourage folks that are in this space to think about advocacy at the local level, at the state level, whether that's using infrastructure dollars, whether that's using local dollars as well. Um, so I think that's uh, that's an important uh, consideration. Um, I would also just acknowledge, you know, continue to do advocacy, I think, with the local business communities, philanthropic communities as well. I think uh, one of the benefits, again, and I, I kind of touched on this earlier, where community organizations saw um, how having connected households that they're serving really brings benefit to them. I think philanthropy uh, in the city uh, and kind of the you know the corporate social responsibility folks um, as well have kind of seen um, that some of their philanthropic endeavors, social uh, justice endeavors, are much more supported through um, having connected households. So I think you know thinking about kind of building that kind of broad coalition, um, thinking about local uh, state funding in addition to uh, making the case for why digital equity work is so important. Um, uh, you know, it was interesting to hear the, the notion that, you know, folks in the U.S. Virgin Islands are saying like they'd rather go without 
connectivity um, that have to share personal information. We've heard that, uh, particularly from our, our, our non-citizens here in Chicago, but I do think many families and others have seen that um, connectivity is almost as, as basic and foundational as water, um, as, as utilities. And so I think um, being able to make the case to the business community, philanthropic community as well, uh, is important to have that broad and diverse coalition uh, to ensure that there's enough local funding uh, and state funding to match what we can uh, receive through federal funding as well. Thank you. And I'm going to give the last word on this um, to Thomas. <laughs> no pressure. It's a little bit of a, <laughs> a little stressful here. Um, I'm just going to add one thing because people have covered a lot of this, but I will say, uh, you know, accountability is one of the big factors in in in, in sustaining and and in and um, engendering more investment into digital inclusion and, and um, digital training programs over time. We've learned a lot from the corporate partners we worked with and AARP and other groups that are focusing on outcomes that if we can show the results of what we're doing, not just in terms of how many people are using the technology, but what they're doing with the technology. Are they getting a job? Are they helping their kids graduate from high school? Are they integrating uh, into a society as a new immigrant or a person coming out of uh, incarceration? As an older person are they rebuilding their social networks are they improving their um their uh you know um uh, health measures and things like that when we can make the case for the results the outcomes that emerge from this work then we can spark that ongoing investment it becomes more sustainable it also increases our partnership potential with other groups that may be focused on those outcomes not simply on the technology part of it but really the social impact and social value and i think that's the place to emphasize Excellent. Thank you. Well, we've come in just on time. Um, and I just want to say that what we heard a lot about today was scale, very much about strategic partnerships, advocacy, leadership matters, information, and making sure that we can gather the information that the information is shared. Um, thank you all to this esteemed panel. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for your service today. This is information that we're going to take back now, share along with um, use to help us build where we go next um, as a as a as a um, council. So thank you very much. I'm going to now turn this over to Dr. Um, Harrison who is going to give us our closing remarks. Hi there, thank you so much, Sarah Kate, and thank you to everyone who's listening into this conversation. I'm Dr. Dominique Harrison, and I'm the working group chair for the DEI working group. You know, today our conversation highlighted that COVID-19 pandemic exposed the challenges Americans from unserved and underserved communities face in accessing high-speed internet access to meet their basic needs from working at home, participating in distance learning, or taking part in many other important activities for which internet access is crucial. The conversation also underscored the need to deliver high-speed quality broadband connectivity across the U.S. and its territories. And we rounded out our conversation by uncovering specific lessons from our esteemed panelists on the availability, affordability, and adoption of broadband services for diverse communities. And there are five nuggets I took away from this combo. One, we need to progress beyond gap solutions. Two, we need to meet people where they are. Three, we need to partner with trusted community partners. Four, we need to scale what's been done. And five, we need to invest in what works. Thank you to our moderators who also serve as work stream leads of this work, Clayton Banks and Sarah Kate Ellis. This includes Vicki Robinson, who did not, uh, who did a lot of the back scene work. And I also want to thank our CEDC chairs, Susan Allen, Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, and Heather Gates. And a special thank you to all our panelists that have participated in this discussion today. Sharing your perspectives helps advance our collective goal in implementing solutions to help close the digital divide. And we need to continue to make more spaces like this to hear from leaders like you. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to Jamila. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. And thank you for your leadership of the, diverse, the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. 
Today's roundtable represents just a portion of the work that this working group has been engaged in during the charter. So we thank you for your leadership. Thank you also to the tireless leadership of the co-leads for Workstream 3, which brought you today's roundtable. Clayton Banks, Silicon Harlem, Vicki Robinson of Microsoft, and Sarah Kate Ellis of GLAAD. You each had a goal and an objective for today's convening and your roundtable nailed it. Thank you for leading the charge. Thank you to each and every member of Workstream 3 who debated these issues, who drafted the questions, and who identified the right people to hear from today. Thank you. Anissa Green of AT&T, Louis Peretz, Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, Broderick Johnson and his alternate representative, Antonio Williams of Comcast, Rebecca Gibbons, City of Portland, and Michelle Cover of Verizon. Thank you also to our chair of the Communications Equity and Diversity Council, Ms. Heather Gate of Connected Nation. Your leadership on this event is greatly, greatly appreciated. And we understand how very busy you are. So thank you, Heather. My personal appreciation and thanks go to my colleagues on the FCC's council staff, Ashley Tyson of the Wireline Competition Bureau. And by the way, Ashley has just recently joined the FCC's team on the council and she has not missed a beat. She rolled up her sleeves and she got right to work. What an impressive young lady. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much. And Diana Coho, Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, who wears so many hats for us. Thank you, Diana. And lastly, to our colleague, Arely Matthew of the Wireline Competition Bureau, who did the great early work on today's roundtable. Thank you. Thank you, Arely. We also want to thank our dedicated tech team at the FCC, without whom we could do none of this. They have guided us so excellently, whether it be virtual or hybrid events for the council. We extend our gratitude to Jeff Reardon, Steve Balderson, and Greg Hall. And my personal thanks go to my boss, Holly Saar, Chief of the Media Bureau, and her management team, Hilary DeNegro and Radhika Carmarker for their support. In closing, let me say that today's roundtable on lessons learned during the pandemic marks the final workshop event of the Communications Equity and Diversity Council during its current charter. We have been pleased to offer four such convenings in the past 18 months. We are very grateful to each of the stakeholders and experts who gave of their time and knowledge to increase our learnings around broadband access, affordability and deployment, media ownership diversity, digital upskilling, and the future of work. Thank you to all for making the CEDC public programs a great success. If you missed any portion of today's roundtable, there will be a recording of the roundtable available online at the CEDC's webpage. Please visit www.fcc.gov slash communications dash equity dash and dash diversity dash council. Please visit our webpage and stay engaged with us on these critical issues. Thank you and take care.